Now this is the part <laughs> of doing a live stream that is always exciting. It says starting live stream. Is it starting it now? Maybe. Maybe not. So I'm going to mute my microphone and that should be enough to make this work. All right, everybody. I'm going to assume that this is live and it's working. Um, so I'm going to give people a little bit of time to, to log on. I just posted something on uh, Facebook saying, join me. Uh, so the, the live stream is going to be, you know, it's here in Zoom. Um, so um, I can receive questions through Zoom. Um, so I'm, I'm periodically going to have to go back through uh, things. However, I got a lot of questions from uh, from all over the world because uh, I did that uh, part one uh, of the, the safety day live thing, which I didn't even plan on doing for those that have missed it. Um, on uh, on my Facebook, and uh, actually I posted up on uh, YouTube as well now. Uh, I just you know, hanging out in the backyard, <laughs> which unfortunately today was a rainy day. I was hoping I could do this outside, but uh, it's it's very very muddy out there right now. And since we seeded the grass, I think it kind of makes sense to, uh, to kind of give that that grass a chance. Um, and so I have printed out. Lots and lots of these things. Yes, I could go back and forth to my computer, um, but there's a lot of really good questions that came in, and uh, and I, I wanted to, to go through those. So welcome everybody. I have absolutely no idea how many people are watching. It doesn't really matter because, of course, uh, you guys have the opportunity to uh, to ask questions. Here, somebody somebody showed up. That's kind of cool. Uh, Mike, welcome. So if you guys uh, that are joining in the, the Zoom happen to um, happen to want to ask a question, I'm opening up my uh, Zoom uh, Q&A. So if you send in a question, please do it through the Q&A, not through the, the live feed on, uh, on YouTube. I can't keep up with that scrolling. If I had an assistant or two or three, maybe I could. But if you do it through the Zoom, um, then awesome. So. Welcome everybody to Safety Day 2020 Part Two. So um, the questions that, that, that people came up with were actually, I thought, uh, really, really good, very insightful. Um, so I'm gonna do these, but I'll also go back and forth through live questions um, that show up through the Zoom um, chat, uh, rather than the, the chat, the Q&A um, area. Although I do have the, the chat stuff open, or do I? Nope. Now I've got a chat window open. So I've got all of that stuff ready to go. Um, we're all learning how to do this stuff. <laughs> it's, it's suddenly a Zoom world. <laughs> right? Okay, so the questions that people asked me, uh, the first one I thought was very funny that somebody showed up was hand washing. <laughs> hey, safety first, right? So yeah, you could uh, you could spend your whole life wearing gloves. I think it's probably not a bad idea to have gloves. But um, is, is that really uh, necessary? You know, it, it, there's a point where you say, all right, do I, do I need that at home? No, probably not. Do I need that when I go to the grocery store? You know, in the modern you know, reality that we're dealing with, maybe. I don't know what that's going to become. But I think the main thing that I want to send out as a message right now in this sort of new reality that we're in is, Take care of yourselves in every way that you can. Wash yourself when you come back from being out in Babylon, you know, out there in the world. Take a shower. Leave your 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 shoes outside all, all the time so the sun bakes them. You can kill kill stuff. Now, that's the knowledge that I have right now is that as long as you you know hair and stuff and keep it clean after you've been coming back, don't touch anything. Just wash your clothes. Wash off the stuff that you get from the supermarket. And if we do that, then maybe. We're gonna flatten that curve and move on to the next chapter of humanity where we go, wow, that was crazy. Good things, you know, things are getting back to normal now. And that we can be squished into little airplanes <laughs> and not be worried about needing our helmet on the whole time uh, and fogging up our visors on the way to altitude. But hey, if that's the way we have to skydive, you know, so be it. Um, so I think it's gonna bring back flat packing. Because this way in the packing area, you take up more space, so you got that six foot buffer. <laughs> All right, 
So that one, I think, was more of a joke question. But you know, if, if people send in a question, I will, uh, I will certainly address it. Um, the somebody said, "How about fact checking before posting?" Please do. There's so much disinformation, so much misinformation. It might not be, you know, sort of devious, but yes, when it comes to to skydiving, you already do it, right? So you hopefully, anyway, you you sort of uh, observe uh, a little bit from the perspective of uh, not paranoid, but you know, sort of suspect. Is this person telling the truth? You know, some a fifty jump wonder is telling you that this is the ultimate truth, and you've got. 30 jumps, well, it seems sane, but maybe you should, you know, drink the water from the top of the mountain as much as you can and, and listen to the people that really have the knowledge, you know. Uh, there are, you know, for instance, you know, like nature, right? So if you read nature, it's probably a, uh, a truthful article. If you read something on Facebook about, you know, biology or whatever, eh, maybe not, right? So I digress, but it's relevant. So gear checks for inspection. Inspection, right? Getting ready to skydive. Um, it's immediately making me wish that I had a rig. <laughs> it's in the other room. Uh, but I think that, that when when it comes to gear checks, look, it's important to start off with the idea that um, you have no assumptions about the condition of your gear. That's what's kept me alive all these years. Is is every time I go to jump, I look at that rig as if some you know my kids were playing with it, <laughs> and they the pin is slid out on the reserve that the Maybe the, the pilot chute's starting to sneak out. That maybe my handle got on velcroed. And the truth is, in my in my life, I catch stuff all the time. So I'll be teaching in front of a class, and I'll show people, here's how you grab the handles, and here's another way to grab your handles. And I'll peel the Velcro to show them how to peel the Velcro, and I'll forget to put it back on. I'll release the RSL to make a point, and then I'll forget to put it back on. So never assume that your gear is in perfect condition. That's the whole point. Is that paranoid? No. That's you having an open mind to the possibility that some, something might be different on this skydive. Um, and now as far as, as going through the gear checks, I think that it's important to, to have a procedure that you follow each time, especially at the beginning. Uh, later on, you can move on from the you know, sort of do list mentality. So when we're pre-flight flighting an airplane, when you're a student, you should follow that pre-flight checklist as a do list. In other words, you read it and then you do it. You read it and then you do it. But it could also be later on as a more experienced pilot, a done list, because you already have it in your head and you go around and after you're done, done, you double check that you got everything done. Right. So there's a flow state that we can create with everything in skydiving. Uh, just you know, the trick is to not slip into the, the flow state prematurely where your, your ability to be uh, really you know, kind of awake and aware of what's going on um, is, uh, is not, it hasn't come in. To full fruition yet, right? Because everybody wants confidence. Everybody wants to feel good about their ability to look at their gear real quickly, like the pool guys do, and just jump. Uh, but the truth is that they may not be going as quickly as you think. Checking their gear, it's possible that if you if you were to just sort of you know kind of look at, at somebody that's really experienced and, and sort of safety oriented, what do they do and how do they do it? Do they go top to bottom on the back, top to bottom on the front before they put the rig on, and then check the leg straps you know i think that th that's uh that's how i normally will do it you know top to bottom on the back top to bottom on the front checking all you know all the key issues and i have those in my mind very very clear but maybe you don't right so you've got open up the reserve flap look at the reserve pin make sure that the cable slides free and clear make sure that the pin on the reserve is all the way in and people are afraid to push their pin in get over it. It's your pin, right? Those pins, the reserve deployment pin doesn't accidentally slip in over time. It slips out. It's the only way it can go. And so given that, you know, that sinking ship that you're in, you have to sort of, you know, keep little by little, you just push it back in, like you're pushing back the cuticles on your fingernails. You know what I mean? It's just life. So the other one is, of course, to, to follow, I think, the RSL or Skyhook, um, because it's part of the reserve pin, you follow it over and make sure that it's uh, hooked on there. And yes, you'll be giving that a second check when you flip the rig over. And once you've done the reserve, you you know make sure that everything looks good. Then you close the flap properly. Then you go to the main. You open up the flap. You look at the pin. You make sure the pin moves, but not too easily, not too freely, right? Because if it's too loose, it can slip out at any time. That's not fun. 
And of course, if it's too tight, pilot chute and toe. Question, which would you rather have? A pilot chute and toe or a premature deployment? Right, think about that one. In my opinion, uh, it makes a lot more sense to, to actually have the, the pilot chute and toe that you can deal with in any number of ways. And yes, people are be like, oh, no, 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 I don't want a pilot chute and toe. That's a high speed malfunction. Okay, yes, but um, it's a malfunction that you were sort of expecting in that you pulled at pull time and you were awake and aware and ready for, for that to, to work out, you know, you know, however it works out. And then you resolve whatever shows up, right? Because you're in that mode. But if you're sit flying and suddenly your bag comes out in front of your arm because you had a premature deployment because your pin was loose, that's not awesome, <laughs> right? So um, my, my feeling is I'd rather have the pin a little bit too tight than too loose. And if I have a decent sized pilot chute that has ex you know, significant extraction force, right? Uh, which might not only be about size, there are certain designs that are, are uh, high drag even though they're relatively small. Uh, but either way, it's got to be a, a, a good design that's in good condition. And your kill line needs to be cocked. In other words, if you've got a collapsible pilot chute, which some of you are students and you don't have one of those, fine, that's one less thing for you to double check. But a kill line is, is normal, right? To have uh, the ability to, to actually have your pilot chute collapse after opening, that's standard procedure for most people. And uh, one of the things that I've noticed is that, first of all, people get so married to the idea that they have to see the uh, inside the window on their main bridle and to see the color is showing up to verify that you caught your pilot chute. And I think that's great, except when they get older, when you get some jumps on it where it's still a perfectly functioning system, it's possible that that won't line up anymore because the kill line shrinks. And as that kill line shrinks, it does go to the point where it won't line up ever, but maybe it still works. How do you know? So I've made lots of videos about this stuff uh, that are on, on YouTube and, of course, on Adventure Wisdom. You'll find the really in-depth stuff. Uh, but if you hang the pilot chute upside down from the bridle, uh, in which, of course, that would mean that if you really want to be sure when you're pin checking that your, your, your kill line is cocked because a packer did it, right? You got to pull the pilot chute out. And then you hang it upside down and you look inside and you see that the reinforcing tape that's supposed to uh, sort of uh, define the shape of the pilot chute is extended fully. And the kill line that's inside there, the suspension line, usually spectra, white uh, line in there is loose. Right? And if you see that reverse where the kill line is tight and the reinforcing tape that goes down the middle, it goes from the bottom of the pilot chute, right? So if I had it like, the, like a mushroom like this, it starts here and it goes up to the center, to the hacky sack area, to the handle. And if it's pulling down on that even a little, you don't have complete pilot chute, right? You've got a partially collapsed pilot chute. And that means that it might not have enough drag to pull your bag off. It might be a pilot chute in tow, you know, where the pin is still in. It could be that it just pulls it up slow and lazy and you get more line twists. Either way, it's not that much fun. So interesting concept that some of you have heard of, some of you have not. I'm gonna guess that most people have not thought of lubricating their kill line. So if you take your, the, the kill line of, uh, that's inside the main bridle and you pull out, let's say from the pilot chute side, you pull it out and then lubricate it with, with silicone. There's spray on silicone. And there's the Cypress stuff, which is awesome. This goopy stuff that uh, comes out on the pad, uh, the kind of a felt pad. And that will allow you to lubricate. And then you go to the other side where the bag is and you pull as much as you can, scrunching up the bridle, and you lubricate that. Then, number one, the kill line doesn't shrink over time significantly. Uh, you have to lubricate every once in a while. I don't know how much, how often that's going to be. But, uh, but if you do, there's a chance that if you forget to cock the pilot chute, you won't have a pilot chute and tow for long. It'll actually cock itself because it is lubricated. Interesting concept, right? So beyond this, um, I think that it's also important um, to, to look at your gear, you know, in between jumps, not when it's packed. I mean, part, of, part of the equipment inspection is it has to be done when it's not packed so you can go sort through it because not every problem is visible when the rig is packed. <laughs> As a matter of fact, most of them are not, right? So that's part of your job if you want to be a safe skydiver. Uh, <laughs> so if you then go down to the main pilot chute, is it packed properly? Is it going to be hanging out a little bit? 
right? So maybe you need to repack it. When I get my stuff back from a packer, most of the time I pull out the pilot chute and repack it. It's the one thing that I can do in two seconds that I know that it's gonna work. And, and a lot of you have seen the YouTube video that I've made on that topic, uh, teaching people a, a, an alternative method of packing. And the cool thing about this method, whether you know it or not, I probably don't, that if you pack this method, not only will you most likely get a parachute if you have an out of sequence deployment where the pin pops, the bag goes, and that'll pull the pilot chute out, that's awesome. But it'll also uh, basically prevent you from packing your pilot chute if you have not opened up the kill line, if you have not cocked it, you can't pack this way. How about that? Interesting, right? So moving on to the, the next part of it. So you looked at the back, the flaps are closed now, the pins have been verified that they're all the way in. You double check the RSL system, the pilot shoots all the way in, you turn the rig around. You haven't even put the thing on yet. And then you look at the three rings. Is it routed properly? You know, so each uh, each ring has to have its own space. In other words, the the big ring that's attached to the rig should be in between the little and medium sized ring. There shouldn't be any twists on the closing loop of the riser. On the other side of it, you have to make sure that that the uh, on the end of the housing for the cutaway cable that the loop goes through the hole in the housing and then the uh, cutaway cable goes through that loop. That's important. I've seen that one done incorrectly. And all you do is just strip it and the whole thing cuts away on that side, eh, right? Bad news bears. So you should know what this looks like. And of course, I made lots of videos that are on, on my, uh, on my uh, Adventure Wisdom uh, website that'll go into greater detail, but please sit down with a rigor and go through all this stuff. Um, other things that you should double check on the front side of it is, again, is the RSL slash sky hook, you know, hooked up or do you want it hooked up, right, for this jump? Maybe you want to take it off and put it on the housing, right? You don't leave it dangling because it's a ripcord. You don't want a floating ripcord, but it's possible you'll want to take it off for, for a crew or for, for other uh, special kind of jumps, right? And then you want to also double check that once you get the whole thing on, that your leg straps are adjusted properly, that your chest straps are adjusted properly, and that your excess uh, webbing is stowed away properly, of course. And you got to check the handles. And I think it's important to check that the handles are all, all the way up and Velcroed properly, that they don't, you know, sort of you just sort of brush it, it shouldn't just come out, right? It's possible your Velcro is wearing out and you have to take it to a rigger and get it dealt with, right? So, I think that you should check it before you put the rig on, but just after you do, immediately do it again, because you can bump stuff as you're putting the rig on, right? So I get the kit on, I double check my leg straps, I double check my chest strap, it's all ready to go. And then part of my equipment inspection also is, are my shoes tied? You know, that kind of stuff. Is my jumpsuit ready to go? Is Do I have my helmet? Do I need goggles? Did I forget my GoPro? Do I have an SD card? You know, things that become less important, but yeah, they're pretty important. You know, if you forget your helmet, you're going to be really embarrassed about it. Um, so um, that's, that's sort of my initial take on it. Um, if those uh, that, are, that have joined us, I can see that we've got more people attending. Andrew's there, Ron Christensen, what's up? Um, I know there's other people that are here uh, watching on YouTube, and that's awesome. But if you want to join us, you go to my, my Facebook uh, and you'll, you'll find it. I've got two Facebooks, right? So you might have to double check <laughs> which is which, uh, but you'll see the invite to the Zoom. Um, so if you guys have questions, if anybody wants to stop me or add something, I can see if you're in the Zoom, I got you right now. And we'll open it up for, uh, if you raise your hand, certainly you're welcome to do this. Um, I just want to make sure that everybody's, yep, I can see you. So if you raise your hand, you're, uh, you can take the floor. If you want to go on video, you can. If not, totally fine. Um, I think most people probably don't want to go on video because on coronavirus lockdown, you're probably in your underwear. <laughs> so you can't see. You have no idea. I could be naked from the shirt down. But I am wearing shorts. So how's that? All right. So landing area in zones. All right. So. So this is a really interesting question, right? So he's, he's saying, um, I'd like to hear and know more about separating low speed areas from high speed landing areas. Um, and I, I did address this on, on a safety first episode. 
Um, but it's also, you'll see it in navigation and accuracy secrets. You'll see it in high speed, um, uh, the high speed video that I made that's an adventure wisdom as well, uh, surviving swooping, it's called. It's a good one, a lot of gold in that one. Uh, but let me quickly reiterate. Um, he's basically saying, have I, have I changed my attitudes about this? And, uh, and I really haven't in general changed my attitude um, in that I, I think that high speed and low speed people should be separated by time or distance or both. Um, if you can guarantee that, that the timing will be separate, in other words, the swoopers get out, get out on a low pass, right? You, know, you get on the plane and there's that guy, Juan Lopez, he's on the plane again. Juan Lopez, who is this guy? He's on every load. So <laughs> cute applause and laughter. Um, if you have that, it's no problem, right? The thing is that sometimes on the low pass, you've got you know somebody that's going to take a, a 15 or 20 second delay on their 170, and then you got the guy on a, you know, a Leia or something that does a hop and pop. Um, you may still find traffic showing up. So even within your hop and pop jump run, you got to talk about it. And if there's any chance you're going to be landing at a similar time, or at least in the pattern in a similar time, right? you need to separate by distance also then. In other words, have the swoop gates over here and you have your, your target over here. Um, now, the way I look at this stuff is you've got this downwind base final pattern that, that most people are flying. And then you've got this downwind base and then corkscrew diving zone, right? And I think of that as like a tornado visually. Whereas you've got this other uh, race track, like Hot Wheels tracks or whatever, they're coming down and down across and then down in. How do we separate those two where this doesn't show up in, uh, in con uh, conflict with the normal pattern? Well, offsetting the swoopers downwind, I think is very helpful. Um, if you plan for the finish locations to be in line, that's fine, right? If the end of the swoop pond or the end of the swoop course is basically at the target, That'll line things up nicely, assuming that people do a good approach on both parts, right? <laughs> Whether you're doing the standard approach or, or you're doing the high speed approach, either way, uh, if everybody does it right, that way the tornado will be offset uh, dramatically uh, downwind from the, the base leg, which is where you might run into conflict because who hasn't been there where you're setting yourself up, up on your base leg, you're feeling good, you're looking good, and then suddenly you realize towards the end that you're a little too high. And if you turn final, you're gonna overshoot the target. And so what do you do? You extend your base leg out this way a little bit and come back in. That's normal and it's a good solution if there is no traffic in that area. So to think that through carefully with each, uh, each location is really important. So if you, if you have the, a condition where you've got, you know, all kinds of people landing at all about the same time, you know, especially big drop zones that are big airplanes, you have to separate the locations. And more and more drop zones have, have been heeding that advice. Uh, you set up a swoop pond, that's great, but not everybody goes for the swoop pond, right? You don't want to get your feet wet on the first jump of the day, and then you got soggy, soggy shoes throughout the day. Um, some people don't mind that, but um, personally, I you know, try to save that for the end of the day unless I got spare shoes. Um, so if you have a swoop lane that is not the swoop pond, I think that's not a bad, bad uh, idea also, just parallel to it should solve that problem. Uh, maybe other people have, have you know, different opinions about that, but um, separate by time, distance, or ideally both, please, please, please. But I haven't changed my opinion about that very much over the years, but I am open you know, to, to suggestions or observations, things that people have said out there, uh, you know, may, may skew my perspective. You know, we say, this is the truth. Why do I call it the truth? Because I've weighed it out and thought it through and all the data that's coming in is sort of harmonious with that conclusion. But as soon as I have dissonant data, as soon as I have something that points me the other direction, it is very natural for anyone to say, yeah, but I really believe this. And so that must be an outlying data point where there's measurement error <laughs> or, or some confounding variable. That's not good science. You know, if your scientific model says that you shouldn't believe in ghosts and you see a ghost, you're gonna make all kinds of excuses why there's no ghosts when there's one right in front of you. So, you know, I don't know, that's it. Maybe not the best example for some of you are like, oh boy, this is going that way direction. <laughs> Not necessarily, although it could. 
All right, so you're about to cut away from a spinning malfunction, this next questioner asks. Um, should you check below you before you cut away? It's your last move on the main. Is there any canopy traffic under you? I think that, that would be amazing. I think that would be amazing awareness if somebody, while they're spinning out on the malfunction, which we all know half the time, more than half the time you're on your back in the line twist spinning out like that, if you could look over your shoulder and have that level of awareness, um, that would be awesome. I would be very surprised, though, because, <laughs> uh, I mean, I've had 13 mouths. Uh, a lot of them were spinning. Most of them, I would say, were spinning. And uh, mostly, I was looking at the parachute and the altimeter and relying on the fact that the sky is massive and that the odds tend to stack in my favor. Um, so... Yes, if you have a parachute that's not spinning and you're capable of looking down below you before chopping, well, yes, that's very doable. That's a, re uh, a reasonable thing to ask people. But I, I would not uh, expect that uh, or even want people to waste time, which is altitude, in trying to see below them while they're spinning. Most people don't even know where down is <laughs> in a spin. I've been there and I know many of you have as well. When you're spinning out really, really fast, you know where your parachute is relative to you, but as far as which way is up and down and right and left, eh, not so much. Thankfully, these handles are in the same place every time, more or less, right? They might move a little bit if your rig doesn't fit properly, you know, particularly a big loose rig, or you don't tighten down your straps sufficiently. Yes, that stuff's gonna move quite a bit, right? It could be up, probably, but it could be up and to the side, depending on the spin. Um, you know, I also think that the, it's important to just, I want to add one other idea here with the spinning malfunction deal. Um, if you are, uh, are in a spinning mal, immediately comes into your mind all these fancy, cool new ways of getting out of line twists, right? So many people have seen the one where you're, you're spinning line twists and you reach up and you twist the risers to bring the line twist down. So the canopy is now more open. And then maybe you can grab a rear riser and stop the spin by pulling on the correct rear riser, which ain't so easy to figure out which is the, the correct one. Um, maybe that works, right? People try that all the time. Maybe they try uh, Timmy Thompson's method of swinging their legs around like that in a circle, the, the wiggle board, where he calls it the salmon. Um, great, you know, maybe you just kick. Maybe that's your, your go-to. Maybe you spread the risers, which my tests and other test pilots have said the same thing. Spreading the risers might help on round parachutes, but it's not helpful on squares. Uh, so uh, observe your data, right? The next time you have line twists, try a few different things. I understand that people don't want to mess around too much, but um, just consider the possibility that the method you're currently using isn't the right one. And consider the possibility that checking your altimeter is more important than how you're fighting. And if you know that you're, you're high, yes, by all means, try, try to fight it, try to get out of it. But if you're getting down to your hard deck, you know, maybe it's 2000 feet for you. Everybody's different in their hard deck. I don't think a hard deck should be below two personally. Why, you know, why, why do you need to spin yourself down to, to USPA's recommended lowest cutaway? Um, I think that that's, that's uh, it's a little egoy, I find. You know, we're like, I have to fight it out. Otherwise, I'm going to feel bad about myself if I have to cut away because that feels like a failure. Eh, you know what I mean? You're not a failure. Your parachute malfunctions, and that it, it happens once in a while. All right. So here's a good one. Simple, elegant solution. Some simple, elegant uh, question. Can you hear my feet? We have like this kid uh, cushiony pad thing. It's like puzzles. And um, I decided to be barefoot <laughs> and I'm standing. So now when I walk, my feet go, which is great because it's helping me remember to not walk around so much. There you go. All right. So the question is, how do we maintain to, to sort of achieve and maintain a positive focus? Um, and I think this speaks to a lot of uh, a lot of different things. I'm going to sit down for a minute because some some of these ideas maybe are uh, 
are better reflected upon when sitting. Um, for me, a positive focus is about nurturing that feeling within myself before I, I get in the plane, before I even drive to the drop zone, before I get out of bed, you know, to establish intention. Because our habit uh, of, of emotion, you know, sort of you could say, you know, my, my habit of emotions in general tends to be within this range. Um, and that is that set point varies depending on what's going on in my life. And I might say, well, this week, you know, it's a bad week. This day is a bad day, you know, because something happened right off the bat and I'm off balance and, you know, I have to find a way to regain my balance. Um, and so we have to recognize, first of all, where am I? You know, everybody wants to feel like they're, they're I'm positive. Oh yeah, yeah, I'm positive. I'm just, I'm just a realist. You know? <laughs> just people basically saying, um, I'm a miserable bastard, but I'm in denial. <laughs> Not necessarily, but uh, <laughs> a lot. So positive focus for me is about knowing which eyes you're wearing. All right. So um, I could I could be wearing these eyes, right? Where I'm you know looking at details, right? I'm looking really carefully, those eyes. I could also use the big picture eyes, you know, where I'm just seeing the whole world, you know, from a wider perspective of the birds singing and the, you know, appreciation sort of values. And then I go back to my sharp focus of, uh, you know, detail oriented solution uh, based thought. And I think we need both. That to me, positive means uh, being able to, to focus with tremendous uh, intensity, like laser beam focus when we're checking our gear, for instance, we're checking the spot, you know, we're observing our parachute as it's opening. And at the same time, we have to have this heart of peace, which comes from living in the other reality, the non intense uh, focus reality, most of the time. Um, that that we're, we're deliberately zooming out into the the observation of beauty, you know, and that doesn't have to just be, you know, flowers blooming. I'm a big fan of, of tripping out on flowers. I'm a big fan of walking barefoot in the forest. I'm a big fan of paddling your kayak in a river and going, Wah-ha, you know, um, and yes, jumping out of airplanes is, is this a tremendous, you know, mostly wide open wow moment where it tickles us, you know, it vibrates our cells on this very high frequency. It's, it's good, right? <laughs> There's nothing like it. Uh, and to me, that whole thing is the why, and it's it's the core of it. So when you think of, of like a yin and yang symbol, there is the, the black part, right, which is flowing into the white part, and the white part's flowing into the black, and you, that's the dichotomy, right? And so you could say there's there's the negative and the positive. Well, it could, you could also just think of it as this is the area that needs attention, the parachute malfunctioning might not be negative. It's just what is. It's the thing that requires your attention and your action. But in the heart of all of that is the potential for the perspective of, wow, I'm cutting away. This is neat, right? And so that, that brings in this other sort of open-minded perspective. So for me, that's the, the white in the middle of the black. And it's the black in the middle of the white. Because when you're in the wide open, hippy-dippy, you know, sort of, you know, everything's groovy uh, mindset. I think you also need to know roughly what time it is. You also need to know that, oh, geez, I forgot I put a boiling pot on the stove. <laughs> I'm burning a pot because I ran out of water. Who hasn't done that one, right? So I think there's, there's both balls being juggled at the same time. Um, it's just that we have to recognize where we are, which side of that equation, whether it's detail or, you know, the, the uh, Indians call this shamatha, Right, narrow focus in Vipassana, right? or Vipassana, some people call, um, sort of the wide open, you know, like compassion for all of humanity, right? So that would be a Vipassana exercise. But at the same time, Shamatha, the focus on this thing, this pin that you're checking, you know, this seatbelt that you're taking off carefully, or this RSL that you're putting back on in the plane because you bumped it and it came off, right? That sharp laser beam focus is part of being a, a badass skydiver you know, parting, part of uh, being able to handle whatever shows up. So positive focus, uh, it, to me, it's not always about feeling 
uh, joyful, but it is feeling deeply aware, right? To me, it's aware with the, the knowledge that you can skew whatever it is in a general direction of up. You're, you're giving a little deliberate back pressure on the yoke, no matter what the situation is, your optimism, your belief, your faith in yourself uh, to be a, a source of, of control over whatever the circumstances is, whether it's the way the parachute's flying, whether it's the way this exit's going, you know, you launch a bunch of people out and there's the people that go, oh no, it's funneling. And the people go, no, I will not let this funnel, right? So that, that sense of power is very important. Um, and, and it comes, yes, from data points in your past, right? It comes from the, uh, the experiences that you've had where you were heroic, for lack of a better word, where you're driving the car, it skids on ice and you do the right thing. You turn into the skid and you go with the flow. And as soon as the wheels catch, you start to, to drive the car again. And instead of getting into a car accident, you managed the adrenaline and you transcended the adrenaline enough to ride the wave, to be the surfer on top of the wave instead of the victim underneath the wave, right? Uh, so for me, positive focus is not necessarily always about being happy. It's, it's being powerful, to be in control. Uh, and a lot of this, when people say power, they're actually meaning force. And that, to me, that's not the same thing. That, uh, that when we're uh, forceful, like bossing people around and forgetting about emotion because emotion doesn't matter and you know you go home and cry in your shower but right here you're on my watch i'm going to tell you what to do yeah. we need to be uh recognizing that that true power comes from uh touch move inspire people you know that kind of thing where you, you bring them into your your why your your reason you motivate them you inspire them to to get what you want to understand it and then they're on board with it right and i understand we don't always have time all this happens it happens with my kids i'll be like do this and they'll say why i'll t tell you later but right now i don't have the time trust me i'm your dad i have your best interest heart i love you do what i say now and i'll explain later but i don't have the time now right sometimes i do have the ability to explain um so to me that's the difference between uh power and force uh force is fundamentally immoral you know Whereas power is something that joins with everyone uh, that, that's in your reality. Holy digression, Batman. All right. Now, somebody asked me about uh, the different manufacturers' MARD systems. And for those that don't know what uh, a MARD is, it's a uh, main assisted reserve deployment. It's a reserve static line on crack. It's a direct bag deployment of your reserve. Um, and I have to say that everything I've seen out there seems more or less equivalent. Uh, I'm not seeing anything out there that's being called a MARD that is unsafe, um, other than the fact that all MARDs have the potential to give you a much quicker and higher altitude reserve deployment. Um, and as we learned, uh, you know, back when I was uh, I was, well, I'm still a part owner of Malone Parachute Club. Um, we, back in the 80s, we had static lines. We dropped round parachutes with the, the static line uh, bags, actually. Um, and it would yank it off, and then the bag would hang from the airplane. And then you'd have to pull the whole thing in. And then we went to square parachutes, and we discovered that something about a square with the same length static line and everything, something about that square, it would get line twists a lot. In line twist on a square is not as much fun. Um, if it is a truly rectangular shape as opposed to an elliptical shape that changes things somewhat, yes, you're less likely to spin in line twists if you have a rectangular plan form, right? Like your reserve is. But we did find that a direct bag static line uh, system was giving, uh, especially if we had the Velcro on there, it gave a little bit of a tug. It was causing line over malfunctions and it was causing line twists. When we stopped the Velcro, we took the Velcro off and we we're actually breaching an FAR, apparently, from what I understand. We took half the Velcro off of it and now we didn't have the line over malfunctions because it didn't give the shock, but we still got the line twists. Um, and that continues to be the case. Then the question is, would you rather have a parachute quicker with yeah, maybe a slightly increased, increased chance of line twists? Or would you rather have a longer delay, lower deployment with lower chance of line twist, but still a chance of line twist anyway, right? 
you always have a chance when you cut away that your body's going to be rotating and that's going to deploy the parachute into line twists. It doesn't mean it's going to spin. It doesn't mean you're going to die. Um, I mean, I, a lot of people have seen the video. I forgot what I called it. Something to do with like double parachute malfunction at midnight. And people say, well, there was not a double malfunction. Your reserve open. Yeah, but I had seven line twists on my reserve over a 2,000 foot mountain. I spun in, in, you know, under canopy or my main was spinning, spinning, spinning. And it drifted across the canyon. This very, very, very uh, tall canyon in southern Norway. Um, and I ended up over the mountain. And so when I cut away, I had an instant, instant reserve deployment because of a skyhook uh, system. And it gave me the altitude I needed to get out of the line twists that I probably would have had anyway. I don't know if I would have had more line twists or less uh, if, I, if I had just a regular RSL. Um, but here's the thing I want to introduce to this idea is that if you think in your head, well, if I have a high performance canopy, maybe I shouldn't have uh, an RSL or a MARC because people talk about this all the time. Um, and I just, I'm going to just want you to weigh this into your equation, into your logical argument. Um, if you think I'm going to cut away without an RSL from that kind of crazy spinning malfunction and give myself the time to use my skydiving skills to get stable, to stop my spin, and then what, wave off and pull your reserve? Is that what you're thinking? No, no. I've been in this sport a long time, and a lot of you have too, and that's a bad idea. Because taking a delay after you cut away uh, has resulted in a lot of people going in. A lot of people have gone in. And we're seeing less and less of it, right? Uh, but like diseases from the past, it's possible that they can come back, right? So consider the possibility that, uh, that a MARD, even though there, there may be some downsides, um, I think it makes sense. And here's the other side of a MARD that I think is great is that in the event that you have a total, um, I think a MARD isn't going to change anything. But if you have a partial malfunction and you're out of control tumbling, let's say with your big wingsuit on, would you rather have that pilot should come out and be sort of stuck on your back or underneath your wing or something, right? You're relying on that reserve pilot should to pull it out. Or would you rather have your main parachute, which is already out and over your head, maybe it's spinning, maybe it's shredded, it broke lines or whatever, but it's got a lot more drag than that reserve pilot shoot. I mean, there's a lot of very good ones out there, uh, but never, <laughs> never quite as good as a main. And so I just want you to just consider that uh, the advantages of a main extracted reserve, uh, in my opinion, it over, uh, it outweighs uh, the risks to it. So I still think that they're smart. I still have one. Um, and if I get a really, really bad day as a result of a MARD, like really, really bad day, I'll let you know. You know, if I hear about somebody or you hear about somebody, you know, please send the information my way um, and, uh, and let me know if you've you know, got thoughts. So um, here's a good one. I think this was from my friend Lena in, uh, in Norway, in Tunsberg. She's awesome. Let me check. Um, so what to eat and drink and what to avoid. That's a good one, right? Um, this is so late that she's probably not getting a chance to see this live. Sorry for the European crowd, but now is the time. <laughs> you know, Because early in the day, I'm kind of too sleepy, tired, and I you know, look like I just got out of bed for about five hours <laughs> nowadays. Uh, and then too late at night, and I'd rather be in casual mode, you know, um, not wearing a collar shirt, you know. So what do you, what should you eat? Well, let's start off with buttloads of water, buttloads of water, bladder loads of water. How about that? <laughs> and you know that already, don't you? But do you know how much water you really need? I'm not going to give you a number. I can't, right? I do know that if you live in the desert and you need to drink a lot more water, but either way, if, if you're going hard at it, if you're dealing with altitude changes, right? So when you do high altitude mountaineering, you drink a lot of water. You have to drink a lot of water. So what do you think we're doing, <laughs> right? You are going up there. And so if, because of the uh, hypoxia, because of the, the desiccation, because of the, the adrenaline, right? The heightened uh, 
level of, of arousal that we're experiencing as, as a skydiver. That loads, man. Sorry, sometimes I have to do that to get my camera to focus. Maybe it's working. Maybe it isn't. Sometimes like, yeah, focus on my hand. Yeah, I don't know if that's working or not. <laughs> Doing Reiki on the camera here. <laughs> All right, so, um, so here's some other stuff you already knew. Sugar. Really? You know what I mean? Like people are eating candy bars all day long. No, 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 man. You're, you're, you're putting, you're putting a bandaid on a hole in your canoe. I mean, I understand maybe you're tired in the middle of the day and you get this quick solution, but it's not a real solution. And it's covering up for the fact that you actually need to eat some real food. And if you get in, in deficit, right, in terms of your hydration or in, in terms of your, your glucose levels in your blood, well, it's going to take a while to come back and a quick spike is just going to cause you to tank later. Um, so my, my formula, if I'm jumping my ass off, um, I normally will eat, um, I'll eat stuff like bananas when I'm jumping. It's fructose. Yes, I understand it's somewhat sugary, but I'll also try to eat something that balances that out, that out that's got fats. So if I can get avocados, right? So I think that's like, you know, a little bit, a little bit of salt, you know, in something that you eat. Um, lots, loads and loads of water, bananas and avocados, that would probably be the perfect food. Uh, for me personally, if I eat like a big lump of animal flesh, <laughs> I'm pretty tired. It, it, I got to like take a nap, which is why I don't eat a lot of animal meat anymore. Uh, I just find that it just brings my energy level down. And, uh, and you can say, well, you know, it's the airy fairy, you know, hippie vegetarian stuff, but just consider the experiment, try the experiment, you know, see how you feel uh, and switching over to, to more of a, a veg, veggie kind of based diet. It doesn't even have to be philosophical. It just be, I want to perform better as a skydiver. What do I do? So try it. And if you disagree, that's okay. Um, I don't think you will. <laughs> so here we go. High speed stalling. All right. So. Uh, what angle of attack uh, does to the capabilities of the canopy, right? So it's cute. He wrote, what angel of attack? <laughs> the angel of attack, that's a whole other thing. I don't know what that is. Um, so the, the specific angle of attack uh, that parachute stalls is really, it's irrelevant. It's hard to measure in the first place, but we can. But we do know that the airspeed is measurably higher uh, when you stall on the rear risers versus the toggles. And when you consider that, that the shape of the wing, when you're in brakes, the shape of the wing is basically a flapped configuration, right? Like when an airplane is landing, um, it's got quite a lot of flaps down because that's how you get down and slow down. It actually reduces the stall speed. It allows the wing uh, to, to continue flying without stalling to a lower speed, and that affords you a lot of benefits. Um, that said, rear risers have a lot of advantages as well, you know, for, for enhancing glide ratio. Your true glide ratio uh, is pretty much only improved by well, getting small in your body and adding a bit of rear risers. So if you add rear risers to the point where it actually stalls, well, that point at which it stalls is a higher airspeed and higher descent rate at the moment that it actually stalls compared to toggles. So given that, Stalling your parachute on landing with the toggles might be a little bit safer, but certainly it's less likely than a toggle than a rear riser stall. So the rear riser stall will show up sooner and it pivots quite quickly and dumps you on your back. The description I have is that the back legs of your chair have broken. That's kind of what it feels like. Um, and so how do you how do you prevent stalling on landing? Let's say you break a steering line. You, you drop a toggle in the pattern. You don't want to get it again, so you just go to the rears and you fly it on the rears and flare with the rears. Well, first of all, you stall your parachute on the rears a lot, a bunch of times, above cutaway altitude, of course. Slow it down, slow it down until it shakes. The tail will go up and down, vibrate, because you're not pulling in the back, you're pulling in the C's and the D's. You go, yeah, and it shakes, and then it stalls. So you get a little bit of a warning, like a stall horn. So to, to sense that indication prior to the actual rear riser stall, is awesome. It'll prevent you from exceeding that point at which it actually will stall. You'll know what it feels like. You'll know the muscle memory, but you'll also know the sensation of that vibration and the sink in. 
So I think that's important. Um, and so I think that it's a good idea to um, to explore the the rear riser stall and recovery, um, not just as a uh, an awareness of what you shouldn't exceed, but also as the ability to um, to find the best glide of your canopy and not be anywhere near the stall because the best glide on rears is not on the edge of the stall, right? On the brakes, you know, okay, maybe, but not on the rears. So you got to find that point, right? So if you go to my videos, you'll, you'll learn a lot more about this stuff, but basically it's a little more than halfway between no input on the rears and the stall point. That's your best glide, a little more than half. And so based on that, um, you're going to be uh, more informed more important for sure. Uh, and the, the other the other question, the aspect of this question he's asking is when's the right time to go to rears from toggles? And I assume he's referring to as you're landing, you transition from the dive to, to leveling off on the rears. And at some point you drop the rears and you switch into the brakes. And I wish I could give you a straight answer of 61.2%, <laughs> but it varies. It varies. If you wait too long on the rear risers, now you're risking stalling, you're risking uh, when you let off the rears, you sink because of the slight loss of drag of the canopy resulting in a forward pitch change and loss of altitude, you sink into the ground. That's possible if you wait too long. So I would say that in general, if you, do, if you measure your swoop distance overall, if you go about halfway on the rears and then switch to the brakes, that's, that's a decent starting point. Uh, in terms of a preconception. Um, if you also practice though, I'm adding rear risers to pull myself into level flight, but it's not working. And even though I'm nose down, I'm gonna drop the rears and spike the brakes. Please practice this. If I'm gonna, if this is safety day, that's one that I really wanna pass on because we spend so much time leveling on the rears, cruising across the ground on the rears, and then sometime later on switching, People haven't practiced the bailout in the dive, switching from rears to brakes. They say, always trust your rears. It's a joke. We don't really mean that, get it? So if you, if you practice, you know, sort of diving the canopy, you make a turn, you go to the rears and you pull and switch. Um, but also to explore the differences in headwind, no wind or tailwind. You'll find that if you ride rear risers longer, facing into a strong headwind, you'll go further across the ground. Whereas if you have no wind or a tailwind, you might find that making the transition off of the rears to the brakes will cause you to go further, you know, especially with the wind, you'll go further. So consider all of that stuff um, and experiment, but you know, that's not really a safety topic, it's just interesting. All right, so finding your spot, it's another question from, from there. And by the way, the guys that have signed on live, um, you guys can ask a question if you want to. All right, find your spot in the pattern. Um, during times of high traffic, negotiating the traffic and landing patterns in general. Awesome question. Um, so first of all, I, I wanna pass on the idea that the target that you planned on originally you know, you might have to, to sort of sacrifice that dream. Fine. Doesn't mean you're going to uh, you know, have to hate yourself for missing the target. You just go, ah, I tried, but there was a canopy there. You know, just like I wanted to swoop, but there was a canopy below me and I just, I chose not to do it. Great. Thank you. <laughs> you know, thank you for being an adult. Um, but we also have to recognize where we are in relationship to the target and that other canopy or canopies. Because that changes what you do. So if I'm setting myself up in, a, in a, a swarm of traffic where there's loads of people all turning in, I have to evaluate how high I am based on the location. And if I need to do you know, sort of a turn at this altitude location checkpoint to hit the target, then I see that that's gonna cause me um, to be interacting with another canopy, well, maybe what I'll choose to do then is go out and back and cut in, right? So, so that's the landing direction and I'm behind somebody more or less. I might go away and then back 
And as a result of that little turn away and turn back, I create some distance and then I have a parallel lane. Um, <clears throat> if I just turn in early, you know, it's quite possible that I'll end up high and have, have myself going too far, right? So you have to think through, how am I gonna share this field with the people around me? And a lot of that has to do with the leader leading in a way where the people behind them don't get screwed, right? Because they have less control than you do in some ways. So if you're the one that's arriving to the pattern first, take the lane on the far side. In other words, if you're doing left-hand traffic, extend your base leg out enough that you're on the far side of the field, not putting yourself in danger, but opening up the field for other people to land in so you can have this one and then this one and then this one. See what I mean? Stacking it up like that. And then after those have cleared, then you can have the next one that takes the next one. Right? Um, so sharing the field is, is about planning the pattern where it's not exactly overlapping. Now, of course, we have different size parachutes, different glide ratio, different descent rate. And so you might be in the same place at 500 feet as somebody else, but shortly thereafter, you know, maybe the smaller canopy makes a turn and he's way down out of your way. So you have to appraise how big their parachute is in relationship to yours. I wish I could give a straightforward answer on that one too, but it's complicated. A lot of these questions are great, but it would take me a month to answer them all. Um, so pilot shoot packing tips. Um, I think I've covered that reasonably well, but uh, if you please go to uh, the, the really old video that I've made and I have a follow-up to it as well, uh, that's on YouTube about uh, pilot shoot packing, just Google my name. It'll show you a method that really is very, very thorough. And in, in uh, the Adventure Wisdom videos, there's one called um, uh, Skydiving Gear Maintenance that covers this one in greater depth. But I kind of already covered that one a little bit today. And somebody said, the perfect landing. Man, I could talk about that for, well, the rest of my life. I guess I probably will. So the perfect landing, what, how would we describe what is the perfect landing? Number one, you don't get hurt. Everybody would immediately go for, that's like the low hanging fruit, <laughs> you know, safety day. You don't get hurt. Okay, yeah, fine. But you also don't look like an idiot. Right, meaning, meaning you don't have grass all over yourself, meaning you don't land in a parking lot, you know. Oh, I didn't get hurt, I landed in the parking lot. Good thing I didn't hit the beamer, <laughs> you know. It, it's, it's about accuracy also, it's about the pattern. Is it, you know, you got a beautiful landing but you cut off three people to get there? Well, you're kind of an a-hole, you know. So change what you're doing in the pattern so that you're considering other people. That's part of the perfect landing. Flying in, uh, in a way where you're not pulling out of a low turn, right? A ridiculously low turn. That's about flying a good pattern, but it's also about knowing how much altitude your parachute loses in the turn. That's part of a perfect landing. Part of a perfect landing is flying the pattern calm, cool, and collected, you know, totally relaxed. And as you fly that pattern uh, in that last turn, you're doing it in a, in a altitude appropriate maneuver, if that makes sense, right? And you're doing it in a way that is a coordinated, graceful uh, flight path into landing. And as you're doing it, you feel good. You feel calm. You feel awake and aware. You've relaxed your muscles. You've relaxed your, you know, your everything in your body. You know, you, you, they say you relax your foot fists. You know, <laughs> pay attention. Next time you're under canopy, the idea of foot fists will make a lot more sense <laughs> when you're under canopy. Uh, but to, to sort of be loose enough that you're capable of seeing more. The brain has a lot more latitude uh, for, for awareness of unconsidered possibilities and creativity in the moment when we're relaxed and happy, not just relaxed, but actually positive emotion activates the prefrontal cortex, the willed action center, the creativity, compassion, all that, right? To see through other people's eyes, to consider what's behind your head, right? And so as you're landing, making emotion a big part of your priority, making the, the body position you're in, one that is you know, where you're sort of sitting down in the harness, if you're staying forward against the, the loosened chest strap, your elbows are back, you've taken up the slack in the brake lines, but you're not pulling the tail down, so you have adequate airspeed. But you're looking where you're going, and at the same time, you're seeing the big picture of traffic, of wind socks, 
of of all the unconsidered possibilities of the rate of closure of descent and how that might vary depending on the sky, right? It might drop you a little bit. It might give you lift at 50 feet that surprises you. You stay on it and you commit to not freaking out no matter what. Now, that doesn't mean you aren't active, right? You might immediately have to make a reaction with your harness to keep the canopy on the wind line. You might immediately have to spike those brakes a little bit to prevent the forward surge that causes you to sink into the ground. You might have to do something that you didn't anticipate. So a state of readiness for me is this joyful lean into going, ha, 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 I got this. It's not, oh, 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 no, oh, no, oh, no. That's a, that's a crash waiting to happen. It's attitude, right? You come into it with a sense of power over your reality, knowing that you're capable of adapting and changing and, and making it work. So as you're as you're rounding yourself out, there's there's really I like to break it down into two main kinds of flares. There's the one where you start a little high, and the one where you start lower uh, in in altitude. And both of them can end in the altitude of the level off being correct. But it's a different flare method. So in other words, if I start my flare a little on the high side and I flare sharply. I level off at 10 feet or 20 feet and it ain't gonna go that well unless I'm really skilled and disciplined to go, whoop, I did that too soon and I'm slowly gonna keep adding the brakes, slowly keep adding the brakes, slowly keep adding the brakes until I land the parachute, which might not be a stand up, but at least it'll be decent. Because if I go sharp and I stop, the canopy will go whoop and then surge into the ground. It's called static surge. Try it. If you flare sharply and hold it there without continuing down, 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 the parachute will go woo to positive and then woo to negative. Um, and of course, when it's a negative mode, it doesn't flare. You know, the second flare that you do, points, the parachute's in front of you, the lines are slack, it's not producing lift, there's no line tension, which is an indication that you're not producing lift. <laughs> and it's, it's just now a tail down on impact, right? Not gonna solve the problem. So if you're high, Ideally, you should slow down the first phase and then shove when the ground comes. In other words, when you're high enough that the parachute's response time is taken into account, you don't wait till your feet are in the grass and then push the brakes down too late. But you have to sort of bring it out of the, out of the dive, you know, the, the dive on final approach of that two and a half to one glide as you're flying on in. You smoothly bring it out and then shove the end of it so that you get a complete level off. I'm not talking about, <clears throat> I'm talking about the little nudge that makes you level off and then you continue smooth through the rest of it. So that's the high flare. There's the lower flare, which would be one quick motion and then slow, 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 slow as you continue into the finish of it. Um, so that would be optimized energy because then you put it into level flight uh, right away, you got a lot of energy, a lot of airspeed when you achieve level flight, and then you can really slow down the, the pace of the flare, possibly even lighten the downward pressure for a moment as you continue on in. And now the lines relax to 1G by the end because you've gotten the work done, the fighting against inertia, the down, you know, is turned into horizontal. You got that done with when you had a lot of energy, you had. Uh, less less likely to, to stall at the canopy because it's high in energy. And then once it relaxes into 1G because you're in level flight and a constant, you know, an object in constant velocity can be considered at rest. And so you fly, 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 and it's slowing down, slowing down. So you add more angle of attack to replace the lost airspeed and maintain flight at zero altitude with your feet brushing through the grass, at least by the last part of the land. And then as you finish, you're in the body posture that is conducive to running, which involves your hands being back, not in front of you. It revolves your, your butt sticking out and your knees being up a little bit as you're flaring, because then you're sitting down in the harness as opposed to lifting the hips. I call the pregnant lady, pregnant lady getting up out of a chair. She's like, like that. That's how a lot of people land because they have developed the habit of flaring in front of themselves with their hands the way they were taught and the hips come forward and the feet swing forward and they land on their ass. And landing on your ass is not safer. It's not safer. Uh, so many people get, get sort of gun shy and worried that, that they're gonna, you know, in trying to run out of landing that they're, they're gonna get hurt. Well, that's what the PLF is for. That's what the role is for, get skilled in that. But sliding on your butt, man, the first time you hit a rock or a bump 
where you slide off of the grass onto the pavement, right? That's going to be a bad day for you. So I would I would urge you if you decide that you cannot run it out, unless you're sure that this landing area is perfect, don't go into automatic slide on your ass. Think it through. If it's deep grass, if it's bumpy ground, if it's rocky terrain, please roll, not slide. And don't make your habit landing always to lift your feet automatically, always to lift your feet. Instead, do the opposite. Swing the feet back so that you're over your feet so that you can roll if you have to, that you can protect your spine, your central nervous system from the ground by having your landing gear underneath your body. And when the pitch of the parachute swings because you hit the brakes, your feet naturally do want to swing in front of you, exposing your butt for a spanking from Mother Earth, right? So the perfect landing, yes, it is one that ends well, but it's a lot more complicated than that. Um, if you like what I'm talking about here, please go to Parachute Flight Safety Series uh, on Adventure Wisdom. Start with that and, uh, and then build off of it. We've got solving common landing problems, lots of other videos, super in-depth. Uh, showing actual footage and things like that as well. So taking downwind or crosswind landings as an out when adjusting for unexpected traffic or obstacles. Ooh, that's good. Oh, by the way, Gary, welcome. And who else is here? And Benny, what's up? Welcome, guys. And by the way, if you go to chat, you know, for those that are in the live Zoom, just send me a message in, in chat if you have a question or something that you want to, you know, Please elaborate on what you were saying, or what does that word mean? Or here's a topic that you haven't considered. But these are questions that I got off the internet from um, from polling people on Facebook uh, after I did the first one, the first live uh, broadcast, which I did the first live on Facebook last night. Uh, so um, crosswind landings are it's something that a lot of people especially from small drop zones where they always land into the wind. You know, there's the windsock and that's where I go and anything else is like, eh, it's freaking me out. If you recognize that, first of all, if I keep the parachute flying in a straight line, which does require a rotation of my heading a little bit during the landing, I have to know where the wind line, you know, where the wind line is, right? So if the wind's coming from here, I do have to flare and look into the wind and do subtle things at the end of my landing. Yeah, I do. I do have to lean on the, the windward leg strap a little bit as I'm looking into the wind. I have to anticipate on final approach that, okay, wind's on this side, it's coming from here. So as I'm landing, I'm looking ahead, but at the same time, I'm gonna turn my head into the wind and it will keep that windward wing from rising. Because that's what tends to happen as you're landing an airplane too. If you're heading down a runway with the winds coming this way off your right wing, your right wing will want to rise when you get into ground effect and dump you over. So you have to use your aileron to maintain the correct uh, roll angle throughout your landing. And of course, what we tend to do with airplanes is we have that wing low a little bit so we can land on one wheel uh, and, and that works great, it's awesome. But you can't land on one wheel so effectively. So I want you to consider that this is not about roll angle as much as is using your harness to maintain the roll angle that you've got right? Not letting it tip over by leaning on the windward leg strap somewhat, but the rotation into the wind is going to be quite an important thing. Um, that, that if you try to just simply yaw axis rotate towards the end of the landing, um, you end up with a better landing. And instead, what tends to happen, though, is if the wind's coming from here, people flare like normal, and then they start sliding this way, and then they look that way. End of story. As soon as you start looking to where you're going, that is not where you wanted to go, you're suddenly in the bad trip. You know what I mean? You're, you're outside of, of the, the realm of everything is awesome. You know what I mean? Everything is about to be not awesome because you looked away from awesome, because you let go of it. You know, you put down your guitar, it's not a party anymore. You know what I mean? You need to keep looking at the wind. You have to keep looking at the, the bully that's pushing you off to the side stare that beast in the eyes and solve the problem. But the slower you're going, in other words, the deeper you are into that flare, the more the sideways lateral migration will kick in and slide you to the side. So given that, uh, I think it's quite important to 
to recognize that that you have um, the ability to negate that side slide by replacing this lost airspeed with yaw axis rotation into the wind as you're landing in crosswinds. Um, so the reason why I believe most people are afraid of crosswinds is nobody has, nobody's told them that story. Most people don't teach it. Most people don't even know it. God bless them. <laughs> so if you're if you know that stuff, you know you're not curve swooping here. By the way, this is just you maintaining a straight line in your landing and not dumping off uh, towards downwind, right? Uh, if you are comfortable with this, then when you go to a, a drop zone or a, you know an in hop that's a beach and the wind is coming in from the ocean, you go, what do I do? Well, you're going to do a crosswind landing. What else are you going to do? <laughs> that's what you do on beaches usually. If you're jumping in Eloy and the wind's going like this, and everybody says, oh, we're landing this way, <laughs> that's what you're doing. You go to the Blue Sky Ranch, you know, your mountains or pond, that's all it is. And so given that, don't be freaked out by it. Don't be going in the plane thing, oh my God, it's crosswind. And immediately, you know, you're, you're sort of into the reality, the timeline of, of oh, this is going to suck. <laughs> you know, you don't even realize that you've set a belief in motion. So consider the possibility that crosswind landings can be just as good as a normal one. They're just a little bit different, right? You just have to keep flying the aircraft. Okay, efficient flat turns. That's a good one, flat turns. So <clears throat> the, the word flat turn, flat turn, the term flat turn, whoa. <laughs> into some brakes, not enough that you're risking stalling it, and bring the canopy around in a way, and there's all different methods to explore, in a way that doesn't lose a tremendous amount of altitude. But within that, that um, is, is the inherent uh, guarantee that when you finish that, quote, flat turn that didn't lose a lot of altitude, now you're in brakes. And you might be able to flare straight from there, maybe, but you might have lost some airspeed in the process. Um, and you might also find yourself, as you finish the turn, realizing that you don't have that much airspeed. And now you got to let it back up and collect airspeed in a way that doesn't get you hurt. Okay, so consider a few things here. Number one, as you're initiating a quote flat turn, which means low roll angle. Specifically, what we're talking about is a low rate of descent turn, right? Low rate of descent throughout the turn itself. So I go into the brakes, and then of course I'm offsetting. If the if I'm quite deep, I don't recommend pushing the low side. I re recommend lifting the high side. I also find that when I do a, a quote flat turn, particularly on big canopies, if I'm in brakes and I lift my hand. On the high side, or sorry, on the you know the, the wing that's rising. If I leave it there, the wing will slowly drift towards nose down in the turn. I'll, I'll actually you know, have a lower angle of attack. I'll start to increase my descent rate over time progressively more and more and more. Just like if I if I go like this with a toggle and hold it, the turn will tend to steepen on most canopies. So instead, try. You go to the brakes and then you lift and then add, lift and then add, lift and then add. And so I call that swim in the turn or taking a sine wave. And you'll find that it allows the parachute to turn quite gracefully. And you can even do this in full flight. And this is, you know, when we talk about flat turn, the goal is achieved. And here, by doing it like this, yes, I will develop some airspeed but it's airspeed that I can very easily transition into level flight as it was deep brakes, which I might not be able to transition into level flight. So I urge people to consider that there's higher speed flat turns and lower speed flat turns. And you have to evaluate your skills in relationship to the task that's required. Um, and that's about rehearsal, plain and simple. It's not just about knowing it in your head. It's about you actually having practiced it, possibly next to a cloud or another canopy, where you make a turn near them, not in front of them, but you know, where you're looking at them as you're in formation close enough 
to have that, that useful data of the reference and see how much altitude you lost. Just, you know, why not? Why not? Um, the other type of flat turn is the recovery from a diving turn where maybe you got a little too steep into it, you got scared, right? Coming back from a bad spot, you start into the turn, ah, ground's coming. And, and you have to recognize, first of all, that in a low turn where you're steep and you're coming at the ground fast, whether it's a front riser turn or it's a toggle turn or rear riser, if, if you negate the input, instead of increasing the angle of attack, you might be getting yourself in trouble. Now, it is true that if you are in a harness turn and you neutralize, that's immediately increasing your lift somewhat. If you're in a front riser turn and you immediately let off the input, that is increasing your angle of attack, increasing the lift of the parachute in the recovery process. But most people are not in that scenario. Most people that are low are doing the last turn to final because somebody cut them off. They just barely made it back maybe, and they're turning low because of that. They make a panic move because they overshot their, their landing location, and now they're heading towards a tree and they do something ridiculous. So, <coughs> excuse me, the, the low turn scenario where it's just kind of a normal toggle turn, the action of lifting your hand to correct the problem to stop the turn so that I can flare, famous last thought. Because the action of letting off that toggle will surge your wing to a low angle of attack. Because right, this is more brakes, right? This makes the parachute pitch. Don't you think this does too, right? And so, in other words, if I'm on brakes and I let off, the canopy surges to a lower angle of attack. The lines go slack, bottom drops out, I'm falling. If I'm in a toggle turn, the same thing happens when I stop the turn. So instead of thinking, oh, I'm in a turn, I better stop turning so that I can flare. I never want you to have that thought again. I want you to think, I'm in a turn, I better flare so that I can stop my turn. And you may find that after you give that nudge during the turn, provided that it's a coordinated turn that works a hell of a lot better. If you don't know what I mean, please go to Parachute Flight Safety Series and describe it in detail harness and toggle and then shove the brakes, I may find that in that process, I'm now at 50 feet because it works so efficiently. Awesome, good for you, but the game ain't over. So you gotta continue to fly the parachute, possibly lift your hands up. Now, at the end of any maneuver where you've got a lot of brakes and you're relatively close to the ground, but high enough that you might be able to collect some airspeed by lifting those brakes, Obviously, you want to be lifting your hands up slowly, but there's, there's two other things I want to add to that model in your mind. One is, if I get small, right, I can't lift both my knees up, but <laughs> I would fall. But if I lift both my knees up at the same time, um, I'm capable, uh, as I'm lifting my hands, as I'm lifting my hands, it reduces the body drag right canopy drag body drag and so if i'm sort of tilting towards negative on the pitch axis towards nose dive in the process of letting my brakes off or my rear risers for that matter if i get big in my body it downplanes me if i get small in my body it helps me recover sooner how's that right okay so um i think that that's one aspect that you have to consider the other that you need to not just consider, but practice, is that if I was to, if I was to be recovering from breaks, you know, after one of these, you know, oh my gosh, I'm low and I pitched it and I realized I pitched it a little bit too much too soon. I'm at 75 feet or something. I'd like to collect a little speed. I bring my knees up and I lift my hands slowly, but I also, if I'm skillful, I could lift my hands a little quicker and then go, Watch my hands. So I lift them instead of slowly. What if I was to try lifting them quickly and then doing a little bump on my brakes to stop the canopy from diving? It's a little more aggressive method, uh, but I think it's important to, to have that skill for stall recovery or for brake recovery to get yourself back to the, the, the glide slope in a static, stable way. 
um, the this flight cycle that some people use. I don't tend to use that term. Um, is it cycles based on what you're doing, and you can squish that. You know, you can you can what do they call flattening the curve? <laughs> you can actually squeeze the curve of oscillation and and reduce the amount of time and altitude necessary to recover from a stall, from being in brakes, from riding rears to get it over the fence. You know, you might be able to get things back under control if you bring your knees up quickly. And as it surges, if you feel light in the loafers, and I like G's, you go oh, just a little bit of a, mm, just a little tuck down, small one. All right. Um, so um, you guys didn't have any questions yet, huh? All right, you're welcome to. Um, so line twists on your reserve, I covered that fairly effectively um, <laughs> earlier. But for those of you that, that haven't heard it, um, since reserves don't tend to spin in general, um, the, the the fact is that if you just hang there, it's probably going to come out. But I don't know. I think you know, a dad in the waiting room, you know, waiting for the lady to have the baby, that sucks, man. I think I'd rather be in there. I know. <laughs> as, as messy as it gets, I mean, I've never been in the waiting room while my wife's having a baby, right? I'm, I'm like in there and wiping up bodily fluids <laughs> and it's much more fun and it gives me something to do with my desire to you know to have things go well and so um, while you're getting out of those line twists um, I think to apply the principles that I've gleaned from mains um, starting with the beginning all right so if your if your parachute is opening into line twists and your body is still spinning and it's getting worse right? Where the canopy is stable or spinning either way your body's still rotating and so i would recommend getting very very big and even arching because that's going to create stability at the bottom of the system and slow down the body's rotation the suspended load will slow down in its rotation um, and so uh, the <clears throat> the rotation will come to a stop and just as it does you have a golden moment, an opportunity to expedite the recovery. As soon as the line twist stops getting worse, where your body's rotating more and more and more and more, and then it comes to a stop, aggressively bring your knees together and push the three rings together at the same time. And that will kick you out and start you spinning in the direction that you want. In the process of pushing your three rings together, you'll find that it, it kicks you out and you're pretty much done. Um, now, the other thing that I've learned about line twists is that I can prevent line twists by spreading the risers if I don't already have line twists, right? So like when my canopy is sniveling and it's hunting for a heading, it's going over here, it's going over there, or maybe it's like, whoa, that one where it hasn't quite gotten it, but it's loading one riser group. If I grab the risers and spread them really, really, really wide, it will hold me on a heading. It'll tighten up the uh, connection of the yaw axis. Of my uh, the yaw of my wing and the yaw of my body, right? That's this axis. By tightening that and widening the bottom of the system, so it's not just a triangle with a point; it's a triangle with two points at the bottom. Rah! Holds me in place. That applies here because if I do this trick where I push the risers together just when it stops rotating at the perfect time, it starts kicking out with so much aggression, so much rotational velocity that I'm capable of spinning the other way, and I have spinning into line twists in the other direction after they come out you have this moment of like i'm in the sunshine i'm in the darkness again right so at that moment spread your risers grab your risers and spread them really wide um now of course the, the people that have shoulder problems this whole spreading thing please don't do it sorry you just have to sort of accept your your physical reality until you make that shoulder stronger by doing the rotator cuff exercises and get good pt uh, possibly surgery for a few of you. Um, don't grab risers if you get shoulder problems, please. But for me, um, I'm 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 finding that it's extremely effective. Timmy Thompson's method for getting out of the line twist, extremely powerful tool, uh, where you put your knees, feet, knees together, you're grabbing the risers and pushing in uh, while you're sort of stuck. Maybe you're spinning on your back, um, or you know, a reserve. Chances are you're not really spinning. The canopy isn't spinning, um, 
but here in this case, you still have the ability to use his method by grabbing the risers, pushing in, feet knees together, up in front of you, and then to the side, and you do this circle with your feet, really big, aggressive circle. Um, if you don't know what I'm talking about, Salmon Untwisting Method by Timmy Thompson. It's on my YouTube channel. Um, I, when I was in Denmark, I got to um, get a, a hands-on tutorial. And it's funny, if you look at that video, a little insider information, um, poor Timmy that day had jumped in shorts and did a blind man that didn't go perfectly. <laughs> Great safety lesson, swoopers and shorts. What? <laughs> I don't get I don't get swoop shorts in general. I just I don't get it. I don't get it. You're going faster near the ground than everybody else is, and yet you're going to be half naked from the. Come on, put some pants on. <laughs> Grow up. It's not the beach. I think it was like motorcycles. Why would you ride a motorcycle with bare legs? You wouldn't. But if you look in that video, he's bleeding. <laughs> he's all torn up uh, from a bad blind man. All right. So that's a good one. How to mentally prepare for the season and for your skydive. Does that work? Can you read it? So how do you prepare for the season? Well, I think it's both the same, but uh, the, the individual skydive is a microcosm mental journey, whereas uh, you queue up that micro journey with the macro one of actually retraining yourself, going through uh, all of the things that can happen and refreshing your memory of what the right answer is and pushing that information further than it was, right? Pushing into that, the, the darkness of, I don't know, um, or worse yet, the darkness that results into the, the, the panic in the dark because you don't know and you need to know now because the ground's coming, you know what I mean? Because you're in a situation. Um, so uh, a retrain for some of you is going to be the best way to get to get uh, back on the horse because you don't have that many jumps and, and you're required to do that and i think that's awesome uh but it doesn't mean that you have to wait to go to the drop zone to start the retrain process what i like to do is um is i hang myself up if i haven't been jumping in a while i have a chin up bar uh, there's a an article on uh well it's here and there if it's like um, keeping your skydiving brain warm or something. I think it was in Blue Skies Magazine, something I wrote a while ago. It's, I think also in my blog, Adventure Wisdom, uh, Brian's blog. Um, so I, I, I set up an old set of risers. The risers are hooked together, hooked, you know, front and rear hooked together with a soft link. So it's looped over that. And then I, I hook in with, I mean, ideally a fabric soft, a soft uh, attachment through the three rings of your rig makes the most sense, but I've never scratched a ring from using regular carabiners personally um, do as you will but if i can hang myself up and sort of just get used to the feeling of you know the harness and the forward and the backward and i get you know therabands or bungee cords or something so i'm getting used to the the pulling down feeling um i think that's extremely helpful all the stuff that you can't do in the tunnel um it's time to do now you know if you haven't been jumping in a while and a lot of you will be uncurrent soon when the green light after the you know the COVID-19 you know lockdown thing is over eventually it's going to be over and you're going to get back in the air is that going to be in a month from now or is that going to be in six months we don't know so you got to keep your skydiving brain warm so watching videos yeah but watching good videos better right to to educate yourself keep pushing 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 uh into the the undiscovered country of, of what you didn't know you didn't know that's a big one um but to just simply sit down and visualize picture in your mind the whole thing start to finish you know like really like like a dream you know what i mean where you, you're putting your jumpsuit on and you're putting on your, your shoes and your rig and you're tightening you looked at the whole thing top to bottom you go through the checklist you walk out to the plane you oh yeah i forgot my helmet and, you know check the gopro make sure <laughs> make sure my eye makeup is on and you know <laughs> you go through whatever procedures you got uh to verify right we're all in different different situations with that what do you need to check you know is it a wingsuit thing or is it you know you're shooting video for tandems you go through that process uh in your mind very very clearly and you may find that when you're doing this you look back on your visualization you missed some steps right you forgot some part of it so then you go back and you do it again you start from the beginning 
You'll start with a calm vibe in your mind. Maybe you sit in silence for a little while first. And then you, you know, possibly in the background, you could even see what if you have video that shows, you know, the actual audit, auditory aspect, right? What if you hear the otter noise? You, you know, click video in your visualization, you hear the otter noise. And then you're two minutes. <laughs> right? Wouldn't that be interesting, right? So some of my videos, I've got raw footage of, of that without music over it. Maybe you can find that. And you visualize the whole thing from the climb out and the check in and, you know, ready, sit, go. And picture the whole thing, the whole thing in, in real time, right? Um, the way I, uh, I used to film landings, right? In the old days, we had these cameras that had a tape. For the young kids, you're like, what? Really? Yes, it was a physical tape. And so in order to debrief those landings, I had to push rewind and stop. And then I'd play again. And if I wanted to transfer the footage to you, it would take as long to give it to you as it took to record it because it was in real time movement. So I think visualization works like that that we want everything right now, but our brain doesn't necessarily work that way. So it's in terms of visualization, you gotta take the amount of time that it takes to do the exercise. So the skydive is gonna take you eight minutes. You need to sit down for at least eight minutes. And you might even wanna sit down for the amount of time that it takes for the airplane ride, because that's the part where people get their panties in a punchy. That's the part where people, you know, kind of get too excited and worried and their eye twitchy eyes, or they pretend like they're really not scared when they're actually scared out of their mind and they keep picturing what they don't want or whatever. And other people are just so in the Zen zone that they're they're just in heaven. A lot of them. And so if you can sort of borrow with that, you know, to, to get into that mindset where you're really, really relaxed in the plane in your visualization, and you're seeing all the details of oh, seatbelt on, no seatbelt off. Did I check everybody else's seatbelt? Did I check everybody else's chest straps and handles? Am I looking around at the, the, the surround and not just my own independent kind of selfish reality? Am I seeing the, the ways in which I can be of assistance, right? And, uh, and I think that's, that process is gonna help you stay current in a way that watching videos maybe won't because it puts you in it. Because when we're watching a video, we're the observer. But when we're visualizing in our mind, we're not the observer, we're actually in the experience. And that's why you know, mentally picturing throwing a basketball into a hoop is almost as good as physically practicing and it's way better than not practicing at all. We know that, we know that. There's loads of studies that prove that. All right, so how do you prepare for the season? Everything. Pull your rig out. Sleep with your rig. <laughs> I know some of you have done that. So where you actually, you pull it out and you smell it. You know what I mean? That's part of being a skydiver, to stay fresh and, and sort of current with all of it. And current just means recent, right? You don't have to recently jump. You have to recently get in the mindset. Right? And visualize. So, um, so another one is landing off safely. Wow. These are some good questions these people came up with. By the way, I have no idea how long I've been teaching, but I have a feeling I'm not going to get through all of them. Um, so how to mentally prepare for the season did that. So you're going to land off. Now what? Um, first of all, and you probably already know this, that prevention is the best way to go with this topic. <laughs> and so how do you prevent landing off? You remain awake and aware, you know? In other words, you're aware of what the jump run should be. You know where you are in that exit order, roughly. Plans change, I understand. Sometimes they call a go around or, or whatever. Uh, maybe the, the, the spotter delays in the door too long because he couldn't get his GoPro to turn on and the last people are really, really far away. But to be aware of it is huge. Um, one of the reasons why I love jumping with a GPS on my wrist I don't jump with it all the time, but um, when I do, it's it's really helped me quite a lot. And these things are, are as cheap as an audible altimeter, you know, Garmin, Garmin watches, there's a lot of different products. And this way, you know, here's the arrow, it says the drop zone's this way, and it's that far. It's everything I need to know. And it even just gives me ground speed on jump runs. So I know how far to take the spot out. Huge, right? So 
that helps me when I can't see outside, when I'm trying to, to, to get a sense of, wow, this is a really, really long spot. And maybe we should go around. Maybe as we're getting into the door, I look at my partner and partners and I say, spots really long. Let's break off high. 6,000, you know? Now, of course, we also need to let the group behind us know if that's the case, please, you know, spread that information. Uh, but if you, uh, if you kind of all agree that we're going to open up high, but we're going to jump run is this way. So when we track off, we're going to go perpendicular to it. Because if you break off high and you track a long way up or down the jump run, what I call riding the butt crack of the jump run, please never do this under canopy or in free fall. <laughs> Stay away from the center line, right? Um, and if you, if you go across the jump run with your tracking, I think that's going to work out just fine. Um, and then you get open high and that alone above the whole like, oh, I've got a long spot. I got a strong tailwind. I go to the deep breaks. Oh, I've got instead now a low wind scenario and I'm really far away. So maybe I would do the rear risers. There's all that. There's a lot to talk about there uh, in terms of prevention uh, in navigation and accuracy secrets videos that would be very helpful for you for eliminating that stuff. Um, but the, the biggest deal the biggest leverage that you've got is to pull higher if you can, if it's not going to create a hazard, right? Um, so the other one is, as you're coming home, you and you evaluate your heading, you evaluate the flight mode, and you evaluate whether it's working or not. So you look at the target, and if you see that target is rising, the answer is not. <laughs> if you see the target is frozen or it's dropping in your frame, well, that is clearly a yes, you're going to make it back, you're good. But if you see that you're not going to make it back, the target is rising, that's the time to consider where you are and maybe the best answer is behind you, right? To actually turn around and face into the wind right off the bat, to, to land on a, you know, a, different, uh, a different farm. <laughs> maybe coming back, trying to make it home, the little engine that could, you know, I think I can, I think I can, is going to cause you to land in the trees. The one time I landed in the trees in 1987, that's what happened. I was sure I could make it back until I was in the trees. Um, so you look at the target and you evaluate if you're going to make it back. And if you're not, you make your decision as early as you can, as early as possible. And you fly over the top of that intended landing area, you know, by ideally 2,000 feet. And you slow down your airspeed and you slow down your rate of respiration. And you calm yourself down and you look at the situation and you see by being in brakes where the wind is coming from, because you'll drift with the wind because you're when you're in deep brakes, yeah, you're like a hot air balloon, right? And so you face into the wind at this point now in the, in the brakes and you look at it and go, all right, where's the, the unconsidered hazards, right? Where's, where's the, uh, the, you know, that straight line that maybe is a fence, stay away from straight lines, right? In general, there's exceptions, of course. There's dirt roads that are a better place to land than the beans on both sides, right? Beans grab your feet. So consider uh, that, that there's, there's gonna be something that shows up as you get lower that your eyes did not see. Your visual acuity is better when you're lower. So as you hang out over that field and make your slow turns, upwind of the target if there's any kind of wind, of course, so that you can be in a power position. And that means you're looking over your shoulders at the place you're planning on landing. If you're staying upwind and you're in brakes, that's your reality. And then you look at it and go, all right, where's the ideal situation? Well, first of all, on my approach, which side should I come in from? What's the safer option if it doesn't work out perfectly? And then in terms of where am I going to glide to if I overshoot? Because overshooting is quite common. People set themselves up, and then if it's low winds, they undershoot. And if it's high winds, they, sorry, correction, if it's high winds, they undershoot. And if, they, if it's low wind, they overshoot uh, because of the wind gradient. In general, as you get lower, the wind tends to get lighter and you, it liberates your glide to go further across the ground. So don't aim for the middle of the field. Aim for the, the far side, you know, kind of close to the trees. So you're basically almost trying to clip the trees if you have some sort of hazard. And that way, number one, you, you don't overshoot into the trees on the other side, but also you're capable of keeping yourself out of the, 
theater of the turbulence, the, the rotor, right, the mechanical turbulence on the, the windward side, right, where, well, it's the windward, the, the, the leeward side of the trees. <laughs> it's really what I mean, right? The rotor is bad news. So that is an obstacle that's invisible. Scott Miller wrote an article about that a long time ago. It was very good. The, the turbulence, the invisible hazard. But it's not completely invisible because you can visualize where it's going to be. It's predictable, right? Uh, in terms of mechanical turbulence, anyway. Um, so other things for landing out is that if you're uh, planning on flying a braked approach and you don't want to be in Timbuktu, like really, really far away from that landing area on your you know, entry into the pattern, well, first of all, you're probably going to want to drop the altitudes of your pattern somewhat. Um, on this, at least on the downwind leg, it helps if you've got wind. And if you've got wind, that tailwind scenario gets worse when you're in brakes. So I would suggest if you're flying a braked approach, and even if you want to do sort of a textbook pattern uh, into a, an off field landing, you leave your hands up on the downwind leg. And as you start to make your turn to base leg, you do it like this. You add the brakes and then bend it around and you start your turn before you get to your base leg line. You start your turn around and if you end up too soon, too much, where you turn past 90 into the wind a little bit and you're still uphill from it, you're still upwind of your base leg line, well, you can always turn to more perpendicular to the wind line and let the wind drift you over. By being in brakes, the wind will push you around in the downwind direction very easily. So to hook back into the wind a little too soon is better than to go too far and have to fight the winds to come back, right? Um, and the other thing to talk about with landing off is not just this technical stuff, right? Because of course, you know, practicing accuracy at your home drop zone is gonna be how you cultivate the real skill here, right? There's, there's the technical aspects. You pick a landing spot and you land there. Like everything else is on fire, right? Like my kids say, ground's hot lava, you know, and they try to walk on all the furniture and stuff. Like everything but the target is hot lava. So that's part of the part of being safer as you're landing off, being skillful uh, in the way that you shift where you land deliberately on the drop zone, different locations, and you you shoot that. And if you miss it, you learn something. You, and then you try it again, same spot. I'm gonna shift my pattern uh, based on what happened last time, and I fix it, right? And I go based on site picture, not based on locations more and more if I move where I'm going to land. And I try very hard uh, to land in those spots. I start thinking about, you know, where is the target relative to me as I'm in the downwind leg? Base is coming up soon. Now the target looks like this. Now I'm on the base leg. The site picture now is anticipated based on my check where I was into the wind between, let's call it, uh, you know, 1500 and 2000 feet. I went into the wind. And I checked my ground speed. Maybe I added brakes to see the point at which my parachute starts to back up if there's wind, right? But at least I get an idea of what the glide ratio of my parachute is uh, as I'm facing into the wind. And from there, I know what I'm doing in the pattern is I'm lining up that sight picture and I, I blend in with it. And it works very, very well, even when you're landing off. Instead of altitude location checkpoints, collecting Easter eggs along the way, right? So part of it of this is about the technical uh, expertise that you develop on the drop zone, actually daring to care about where you land. Don't beat yourself up about it. Just keep trying and you go, all right, well, that's what happened. It's not, it's not a failure. It's information and it's information that makes you a better canopy pilot, right? So you develop that, that clarified intention and you practice it and you practice it and practice it until you're really confident. And then when you find yourself not being able to to make it back to the landing area. If you make that decision nice and early that you're not going to make it, you put in the brakes and then you slower, longer, calmer, you know, breathe slower, breathe far longer and let your whole body become calmer, even though it's uber intense, even though you know that there's a chance that this could go badly, but the fear that it's gonna go badly 
simply increases the chances that it's going to do that. You know it. So you got to stay in your place of power, your, your, your place of focus, your, your, your place of sort of active mind. The prefrontal cortex has to you keep that candle lit. You know what I mean? In the front part of your mind. And you look at what's going on, you stay calm, and you do what you got to do. Um, and, and you will find that if you can stay in a place of emotional power, almost like, oh, this is exciting, you know, instead of, oh, this is scary. Same level of adrenaline. It's just, how did you interpret it, right? Are you leaning into the roller coaster ride? Are you gripping it going, oh, I feel powerless, you know? That doesn't work. So I see that somebody put in a question. Um, visualization may be available in the short term. Oh, sorry. Oh, there you go. So Ron was commenting about the uh, the visualization. A um, few words when you're through about landing out without any wind indicators and unfamiliar terrain would be good. Seeing this problem more and more over the past couple of years here in Germany, that many people are not really aware what is important to look for. So thank you. Thanks, Benny. Um, yes. So I covered some of that, didn't I? Um, but not all of it, because you will get surprised by ditches. You will get surprised by, by you know, cattle. <laughs> it's true, right? Um, the main thing is that you have your eagle eyes on, right? That's what my kids call. Where you're, you're not just looking through the eyes of fear, but you're looking for the eyes of curiosity. What is it? What is it? What is, what is what's going on? What's going on? What is this? And it's not paranoid mind, but it, it can feel a little bit like that because you're so awake. You're so switched on. And what allows you to stay on top of that in a place of power is to continue breathing big and slow. And maybe you do like John Glenn did, sitting in his capsule. You guys you know what he used to do waiting to, to launch? Whenever, whenever he was nervous, flying, he'd hum. He'd hum a little song. Mm -hmm, mm -hmm, mm -hmm, mm -hmm. Maybe the next time you're in this kind of a crisis situation, you call it a crisis, you could call it an opportunity for brilliance. <laughs> you continue to breathe and then you just find yourself and I get like circus music sometimes in my head. I get that. So, so this way, as a result, you're able to um, stay in a place of power, stay in a place where you're still in the game, looking around at all that's in front of you. Um, and, and hopefully uh, it won't surprise you. Now, of course, if you see that the landing area is not flat, if you see that, that you're landing in tall crops or something, don't try to slide on your butt. And trying to stand up the landing might be just as dangerous as time, trying to slide on your butt. You kind of have to evaluate that one. But my, my experience is that when people go into the habit mode of flaring uh, their, with their hands in front of them, like Thor's hammer, and their shoulders go back against the reserve parachute and the feet come up, now you cannot stand up and you cannot PL up. Those are the two things that you really would like to do. <laughs> the sliding on your butt in an off-field landing is a poor, poor, poor choice. So how do you keep your landing gear down when you're doing a flared landing where it pitches? You know, you flare behind you with your loosened chest strap, you sweep your feet back, you lift your knees up, and you keep your feet under your body with the rubber facing down. And then you make your decision when you're halfway through your flare, whether this is going to be a stand up or it's going to be a roll. And as you're you know, going into a, uh, a roll and somebody had actually asked that uh, as, as one of the next questions, it weaves in very nicely. If you're moving forward across the ground, you cannot PLF with your feet facing forward. That is not a PLF. It's an FKF, a feet knee space, which is really fun to film but it's not that much fun to do. <laughs> and the way that you avoid that is, feet and knees are together, slightly bent under tension, and you turn them to the side, and say 30 or 45 degrees off of the direction of motion, at least, at least. And the balls of the feet are the first thing that touch, but it rolls up the side of your foot, this way, as you roll, and you present the whole side of your body like a banana in that direction and you keep flaring towards your knees because the parachute's job is not done just because you started PLFing. You keep pushing towards your knees, not behind you. Towards your knees will allow you to finish the flare and tuck your arms in so they're not in danger, and you present the side of your body like a banana, and you turn away 
from where you're rolling, right? You don't face down, right? If you roll and end up on your face, it's not a PLF. You got to turn away from the planet. So it's like flare and your hands go up towards the sky as you're rolling. And then you just tuck into a ball and you just roll it out. Um, other things to consider with landing out. It may not be flat. It might be a hill. So <clears throat> show of hands. Who thinks that landing into the hill is a good idea? <laughs> Unless your parachute has tremendous lift coming from a very efficient design and also a whole lot of airspeed and a buttload of pilot skill hanging underneath it, landing uphill is not a great idea usually. Um, whereas landing downhill, which sounds better, often results in a flare and then suddenly I've got a lot of altitude and not a lot of airspeed and now I don't know what to do with it. So landing downhill can be hazardous as well. So if you can see the terrain really well and you might be able to make little corrections as you're landing and you're, you know it looks okay, you're fine at a thousand feet, you're like, I got this, I got this. And you come in and you're like, whoa, I can see the grade is like this. Maybe I turn a little bit in my, in my approach using harness to carve myself to a heading where I am, uh, I'm going across the hill. And if I'm going across the hill, I can apply the principle that, um, that there is a straight line that is level if you go across the hill. That's the only straight line that's available. So like when you're mountaineering and you're doing a traverse, you don't walk with your feet wide, like as wide as your hips are. You walk in line, right, as you're walking on a slack line in a traverse. And that way you're not going one leg up, one leg down, one leg up, one leg down, right? So when you land on a hill, you run like this. And if you got to roll, well, you know, you will naturally roll down the fall line. <laughs> Good thing I got a parachute on. All right. Uh, so hopefully that that answered uh, parts of your question, Benny. Um, uneven, unfamiliar terrain. Yeah, wind indicators. So um, you won't have a wind indicator when you're landing off most of the time, but it doesn't mean you can't figure out what the winds are doing. Being in deep breaks when you're uh, above your landing area before the pattern, you know, so you're up above a thousand feet, deep breaks, slowly rotate into what you think is the wind. See if you're sliding sideways, it'll give you more information about where the flow is moving you. Uh, it's possible as you get lower, it'll change somewhat, but not hugely, you know, once you get down below 2000 feet, it, it probably will stay more or less the same heading. Um, the other thing, of course, is you're, you're looking for grass blowing, you're looking for trees moving, you're looking for waves across water, that sort of thing. Uh, but more than anything, I think it's important to do stuff like, okay, mental, mental drill. You're on your downwind leg and you look at the ground and it's moving really fast. <laughs> think about this. You're on your downwind leg and the ground is moving really, really fast. When you turn around into the wind, the ground will be moving very, very slow, right? So it's an indication on the downwind leg that you need to turn early before you get to the target, before you get to the target, because you're gonna have to turn more than 90 degrees from the downwind to the base so that you can stop yourself from sliding away. You gotta turn into a holding crab to cut it across the wind line. All right, so here's another one that's even more fun. You're on your downwind leg and you see you are really not moving very much at all. You're just barely moving on your downwind leg. It's really weird. Like, why am I not going anywhere? You're about to downwind your landing, dude. <laughs> and so you might have to step outside of your preconceived notions in, in this moment and go, all right, I'm landing off, probably no traffic. Probably you should look anyway. And then maybe I've realized that I'm actually already into the wind and I need to go to brakes make a breaking turn, slide myself into the position where I'm, I'm gonna fix it. That's the kind of ninja skills that, that, uh, that you will need from time to time to be able to add breaks and make a sharp little quick turn and then let it fly again. And you're staying small in the process of recovery so it doesn't die. You're ready to you know, staple a sharp little application of the brakes in the turn so you can make a very aggressive heading change without losing significant altitude. Your parachute can do this. But you can't just pull this rabbit out of a hat when you need it. You have to practice it. You have to intellectually understand it. And that's why I talk and talk and talk and talk to try to explain it in multiple ways so people get it. Because I actually give a shit if you live or die. You know, I, I care if you hurt yourself or not. 
I really do. Uh, and yet it's your job to take this information and run with it, to physically practice it, to, to psychologically, mentally, visualization wise, practice these things. I'm here and now I'm going to go like this. And where would I go? I'm setting myself up for a high speed approach and I got a bail. I can't do it. Now what? Picture in your mind. I was here and I can't do my turn. So what do I do now? Where do I go? Because I'm out of position for a normal approach. How do I solve that problem? It doesn't get me hurt and it doesn't get somebody else hurt who's flying a normal pattern. Because if you're doing something weird, you have no right to be in a public space. <laughs> you know what I mean? You know, there, there may be exceptions to that rule if you're in the East Village or something. Um, <laughs> so, all right, other things. If you guys want to add stuff to the chat, you can. Otherwise, I'm going to go back to um, to the list of things that are here. It's a marathon. It's already getting dark outside. It's crazy. Uh, but I'm glad. I mean, I said that I would do a safety day thing a little bit more, you know, higher resolution than before. Okay. Um, it's uh, the the other thing that, that people were asking me for is uh, is hard deck the idea of a hard deck uh, and presumably you know you could say well there's the hard deck for opening the main hard deck for cutting away uh, they're kind of two separate issues uh, I think that we should be you know building up our hard deck for break off and, and deployment everybody should be higher uh, there's nothing wrong with opening higher as long as we all do it right. Uh, it only gets complicated when he wants to pull a two and he wants to pull it four or five and he gets up for him and you know flies under him and then opens that becomes a major problem but if we all just decide you know what screw it let's just all open at four let's just you know, like everybody let's just open at four you know break off at six <laughs> why not you know break off at six five we can make that normal and and then we get open and we we enter a whole new sport called formation parachute flying you know, no contact, and we cultivate our skill in the aspect of skydiving that actually matters, right? Free fall skills. I mean, yeah, it'll save your ass in the wind tunnel, you know. <laughs> so you definitely need certain free fall skills so that you can deploy stable so you can get adequate separation from the other jumpers, so that, you know, all that. But uh, we know what matters more, you know, in terms of, of, of uh, skill resulting in safety, canopy skills, man. It's all about that. That's why I do what I do. I spent a lot of years coaching free fall and free flying. That was kind of my thing for a long time. But um, I just realized that this is this is the area that needs to be taught. So let's do it. Hard deck. Um, the other one is cu is cutaway, of course. Uh, and when you consider you know a typical reserve opening. Um, will take you under 500 feet. And if it's a skyhook or something, it could be, I mean, I've seen them open at 100 feet. I've also seen skyhooks not work because the RSL was not on there, right? Maybe it popped off. Maybe they forgot to hook it up. I did that once. <laughs> I, didn't, I didn't actually have it hooked up uh, because of the jump that I was doing. And I thought I had it and I had my reserve ride and boom, it opened up. And I, I remember thinking to myself, that was a really, really nice, opening man that skyhook is awesome and then i looked at it and i was like oh <laughs> i didn't have a skyhook um so a normal opening if you do if you actually execute you know the, the uh, nice quick way and you don't delay at all it's usually pretty damn good openings pretty quick um and it'll be let's let's call it 500 feet or less right um if you in your mind think i have a marg that makes me super cool that means i can cut away at like 500 feet if i need to I call bullshit. And here's why. Because in the event that that skyhook jumps off or, you know, maybe there's, you know, other marks that have have uh, opportunities for, for failure in that regard. It doesn't mean you're going to die. It just means you have a regular opening, you know, that you got to pull that reserve ripcord or it's simply relying on the reserve pilot chute now to pull uh, your reserve parachute out. That's, that, these things continue to happen. Uh, I mean, it's, it's happened loads of times where and people have done a demo they're like oh come try the sky hook you can jump with a, a third parachute a tertiary and you you demo a rig and i know that upt did, did that for quite some time and people were you know like wow okay this sky hook really is quick i love it uh, and it sold a lot of them uh that said there has been uh, situations where it it didn't work and that person had to pull their reserve and freak them out um so given 
that possibility, uh, please don't change your hard deck just because you have a Marg. Um, you know, it, to me, that would be like, oh, I don't pull anymore because I have an AAD. <laughs> you know what I mean? It's just dumb. When you when you chop, plan on on having to execute properly the whole story and uh, and have that well rehearsed. And if you're going to change what you're going to do from whatever you were originally taught to something different, maybe um, you need to physically rehearse that ad nauseum a lot more than you think, a lot more than you think to change that. Um, so to, to create a new a new flow state. But uh, either way, I, I think that hard decks should be I mean, personally, my hard decks 2000 feet. It's a, it's a nice round number. It's easy to see on the altimeter when my, my brain is, you know, sort of on fire from the adrenaline. Uh, I don't want to have to split hairs. It's as that's a, you know, 1600 or 1500 or whatever. I just did it recently. I was flying in Dubai and I called break off. I was like, all right, we're at 2100 feet. And I think I'm going to break off. And then I look at, look the second time. I wasn't under stress. It was just, I did a quick look. It was a digital altimeter, right? So it's, it's easier to misread, I think, a digital altimeter than one with a needle on it interesting thought um and sure enough i was at 2700 feet not 21 and so you'll see it i think it's my most recent video uh flying over dubai um <clears throat> that i just put out on youtube i said oh i guess we don't have to break off after all but what if it was the other way around right so uh i i think that it's important to to practice looking at an altimeter and looking just a little longer just just a little longer instead of this right you actually give it the time to be sure that you see it correctly and at the same time you're aware of your periphery you're aware of you know sort of the object permanence of the rest of your reality <laughs> that there that it's it's not just there but it's flowing and moving the other canopies the location right and we lose that kind of a thing when when we're hyper focused uh on on anything the higher the adrenaline level comes in, the more rain man we are. You know what I mean? The more that we're just just fixated on this one thing, this slider that we're trying to do, or I'm trying to fix my toggle, you know, or I'm trying to fix my leg strap or, you know, put on my rouge under canopy or whatever it is, I can lose the awareness of the big picture in the way that a child loses object permanence when you hide behind something and then you go, ah, you know, ah. When you're out of the frame, you don't exist for them, right? That's why this is so amazing for a little kid. And I would argue that that adults have object object permanent issues that that ebb and flow with emotion. And the higher the level of emotion that we have, uh, particularly negative emotion, we tend to get more of a tunnel vision reality, where we forget to check altitude when we're under spitting malfunction, right? We forget to break off when we're trying to get to that next grip so we can build the formation because if we don't build the formation, we're going to feel bad about ourselves and our ego can't take a hit because we feel vulnerable, you know, the insecurity causing low break off. I say, screw it, break off, fix it on the next jump, you know? Um, so having that Vipassana awareness of what's outside of your will, you know, your desire, your focus, uh, and you might be focused on something that you don't want. You might be focused on something what you, what you do want either way you may not be aware of what's outside of that little reality right uh, we have a code word in our house bubble so when when i'm in my own little world and i'm, I'm <clears throat> not seeing that it's kids bedtime or something like that laura will say bubble in other words i'm in my own little bubble universe not realizing there's a universe outside of my thought process so just just consider regularly bubble you know all right, so I see another comment here. I um, think that is uh, perfectly explained. Hopefully they are listening. Oh, <laughs> thanks, Penny. Um, other thing, also concerning, uh, also a concerning thing <clears throat> with the outcome of the new high performance canopies, the awareness, uh, what is still high performance in that this canopies don't change overall, but might look more forgiving, could be some uh, words worth. Okay. Um, that's, that's a tricky one, isn't it? <clears throat> so if you were to look at the, all the new designs that are available, there's a lot of real fancy canopies that are, that are marketed towards 
uh, folks that are lower experienced that, you know, 10 years ago, you would have, to, you needed 500 jumps to jump one of those, <laughs> you know, not just in wing loading, right? We started to become more and more aware of what, of, about how wing loading affects performance and how it increases, you know, higher wing loading increases your chances of having a bad day. Um, that said, you also have to choose your day and not jump when you're on a big parachute, you know, when it's really windy, for sure. Uh, but I think that it's important to, to recognize also the type of canopy, the shape, right? So I can give you a 190 that's a high-performance parachute, and you will love it. <laughs> Less toggle pressure, it's really fun, it's great. The problem is that when you flare asymmetrically, it doesn't just turn a little bit, it dives you into the ground. Not to mention, when you take, for instance, I'm not going to mention who, who, uh, who this is, but I have a very good friend um, who has a drop zone and they use uh, as their transition canopy after their student parachutes, they go to big stilettos, like stiletto 190, 170. And they say, well, that's great because when you turn a stiletto, it doesn't lose a lot of altitude. And when you let off the, the input, it goes whoop and it flattens out right away uh, in the way that the pulse does and the merit, you know, the parachutes de France one. Um, so a canopy with a very flat recovery arc, a very short recovery arc will uh, be, you'll be less likely to hook in. Here's the thing. If it's a full elliptical, like a stiletto, if you've got a toggle fire on opening, like you'll see in the most recent YouTube video that I posted, <laughs> toggle fire, you may not have the awareness to add the rear riser to hold your heading and then deal with the other side after you've, you know, controlled the situation stop the parachute from spinning. I mean, you get 20 jumps, you're not ready for that. And a full elliptical canopy will spin faster. It'll lose more altitude. I mean, you can get yourself disoriented. Uh, so I think part of, uh, part of the decision-making process has to be, uh, what if it goes badly? What if the parachute doesn't open well? You know? And most people don't, uh, they don't select their spouse based on um, what kind of X they would be, you know, would they be the vindictive ex that takes your kids away from you? Or will it be the, the nice one that you still want to be friends with and you get to know their new spouse and you're all friends and everything's great, right? Not everybody is going to be capable of that. In some parachutes, like that is a metaphor, some parachutes, if it goes wrong, it goes really wrong. I mean, I've seen a lot of people with new high performance canopies, especially uh, these Schumann platform wings that have so much lift for the square foot. You know, so much airspeed, low drag, but also very good slow, slow flight. Uh, they're wonderful. They're, I mean, they, most of them open really, really well. Until they don't, <laughs> right? It's like, you're like, oh, it's, I have a unicorn now, you know? She, she thinks that my, you know, uh, my unshaven face is handsome and she doesn't mind that I don't always do the dishes. And yet she's super hot and she likes to hammer nails and, and she wants to get chickens in the backyard. What a great one, right? I have a unicorn. Uh, there are no unicorns. <laughs> you know what I mean? When a parachute is high performance, it's high performance. And so if, if that parachute is, is quite elliptical, you may find yourself every once in a while with a spin that scares the crap out of you. I've seen a lot of folks with these, you know, really small, fast canopies that rave about it until they're walking in with their reserve over their shoulder and their eyes like this like you know breathing like and i say what happened what happened like, I, I didn't know a parachute could spin that fast you know and th this guy this is like the most experienced guy in the drop zone you know the one that's like super cool all the time and they do the beautiful 450 and they cruise across the landing area and they land beautifully and you're like i want to be him when i grow up and you see the look in their eyes with the bloodshot and you know and you think okay there's a, there is a heightened risk with heavy wing loading and with severely elliptical taper. It's just the reality. And so what does that mean? You should never jump them? No, you jump them when you're ready. When, when you believe you're ready, based on not just your emotions, but the skill uh, exercises that you force yourself to demonstrate and the opinion, I'm gonna say it, yes, of other people. If you're the one that's like, well, everybody's against me. Nobody thinks I should downsize and I know better. You know, first of all, if you're holding this posture when you're, you know, defensively saying, no, I, you know, I know what I'm doing. Dude, you're the next one. <laughs> I'm sorry. <laughs> I'm going to dial 9-1 and I'm going to wait. 
<laughs> and I have the crutches sitting here ready for you because you're going to need them soon. And it's not it's not a personal affront. It's just a a mentality that is taking your desire to feel confidence and shifting it all the way over into overconfidence where you're like, la, 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 you know, because you're trying to nurture your, you know, I don't want to be scared of the big bad wolf thing. And your demonstration is actually to the world, not what you think it is. You think you're being brave and you're actually just showing everybody that, like Dick Swanson said to me a long, long time ago when I, I, I think I, I stalled it. That's what it was. I sank my canopy into the target. I did not have many jumps at all. Stalled it out, landed flat on my back in the middle of the target. And I was like, dead center. I was proud of myself, you know, but I was young and I could take a hit. And he was like, dude, he did, probably didn't say dude. He didn't say that. But it's like, Brian, you're not showing us you're good. You're showing us you're stupid. And it stuck with me. It did. Thank you, Dick. This is Mike Swanson's dad, if you guys know who Mike is. Um, and if you take your ego out of it and you really, really listen um, to what people are saying, uh, you, you, you're not foregoing, you're not, you're not skipping uh, the confidence thing. You're not skipping what is coming, you know, with so many things in skydiving. And we're not saying no to the wingsuit, to the smaller canopy. I'm not saying no to you. I'm saying not yet. <laughs> right? That's all. And I'm not saying don't start practicing towards whatever that thing is, but you because you should. Up high, you want to be a swooper and you got, you know, 50 jumps? Well, absolutely. Start working on up high, you know, above 2,000 feet, front riser turns and driving in and switching to the rears and all. Practice it. Absolutely. Just don't do it near the planet, please. <laughs> don't do it in traffic yet. Um, make sure that you're, you're, you know, taking your step-by-step -step process so it's not like one day suddenly you're on a wingsuit or suddenly you're on a smaller canopy and it feels like this whole new reality. Instead, creep towards that little by little in your mind in terms of visualizations and in your body in terms of physical practices and you'll find yourself surviving uh, to a fairly ripe old age, hopefully, <laughs> as you don't get the virus. All right. So um, hopefully that answered Benny's really good question. Um, so there's some more. So emergency exits, I covered that already uh, in, the, in the first one, uh, but I certainly would, um, I would urge everybody to go back to that, uh, the part one, uh, the one in the backyard, the more sort of casual one with the dog barking. <laughs> Sorry about that, but I, don't know, I thought it was nice to be able to you know, enjoy uh, company in my backyard. Um, but as far as the exit altitudes and procedures, I do want to add something to that. Um, a lot of you guys are on parachutes that snivel, right? You pull and then a thousand feet later, you get an opening. I personally, I think that if your parachute snivels for a thousand feet, you need to modify it, you know, to put a mesh vent in the slider or, or something uh, to talk to the manufacturer, of course, about what is the same way to deal with it before you go modifying an existing product. But um, I think a thousand foot snivel, it falls into the category of, of uh, if I wanted to be in free fall, I wouldn't have pulled. Um, so if that's the case though, and you're, and you're at say 2000 feet and the engine quits, if you jump out right now and you open your main, there's a chance that you're going to get that parachute over your head before the Cypress fires and gives you a two out entanglement and then ironic death. Right? <laughs> I jumped out of this airplane that was on fire or something, a wing fell off, and I ended up dying from a double mal. Right? So I would suggest um, going to your reserve because, first of all, you don't know if it's going to snivel down there. You don't know. Low speed deployments tend to open slower. If you get on the rear risers and you give it a tug, you might find you can open a snivel quicker. Uh, sort of, you know, grab the top, don't unstow a toggle, just, you know, you might be able to actually open it, open the snivel up quickly. But uh, if you're down, if you're getting up 2,000 feet or below, I would say definitely go straight to your reserve. Don't pull it before you jump out of the plane put your hands on it and or at least one hand on it um, before you leave the airplane and 
arch and pull. Be very picky about how you exit. Face forward and arch. Sweep your knees back. Put your pelvis forward. Don't stick your feet out too far, but a little bit, a little bit. Bam, and arch. Higher probability of, of you know, getting a canopy over your head if you go with the TSO'd one. You know, the one that's designed to open a little bit quicker. Um, that's, you know, it's an emergency parachute. That's what it's for. This is an emergency. Then the question goes, well, I'm in a twin otter. And I'm not the one sitting by the door. And he says, everybody out. 2,000 feet. By the time you get to the door, you might not even be able to exit. So consider that you should stay where you are and hold your seatbelt in your hand. Maybe you release it and you're ready to go as people are exiting. But if the pilot, you know, if or you see the altitude is getting that low, you know, you're getting out to a grand or something, unless there is a major reason to get out of that airplane, um, you're probably better off staying with it. You know, so some people will be able to get out, some won't. That's a kind of a bad situation to be in, but it's possible. Um, center of gravity is really important. Keep that CG stable as people go. Everybody needs to re remain where they are. It won't be so hard and uh, slow to get out the door in most cases. Um, obviously, there's all kinds of variables here. I can't predict it. Um, but what's the lowest that you would go out on your main? I think that we need to be considering that that 2,500 feet, I think it's a better figure than 2,000 for making that transition in your mind for whether you're going to go for the main or you're going to go for the reserve. Um, you know, if, if you're below 2,5, I'm leaning towards suggesting that you just go ahead and, and go straight to, to the reserve parachute. Um, so anyway, just a thought. Um, <clears throat> so it looks like I, I covered a bunch of these things already that I'm reading off the list. Um, yeah. Oh, here's a good one. Keeping the door closed on takeoff. I know sometimes it gets really hot. And you want that door open as humanly as, as, as quickly as humanly possible. But if the door is open on takeoff and somebody sitting by the door has their parachute come out and they're seat belted to the aircraft, that's a bad day, right? Likewise, if you open the door before people are ready and seat belts are still on, same scenario, somebody's parachute could open when they're still attached. And now it's not just them getting, you know, shredded through the wall of the plane and hitting the tail and tearing up their parachute and their body at the same time. You know, you have a right to kill yourself, I think. I think you do, but you don't have a right to kill other people. So all the seatbelts must be off, all of them, prior to, uh, prior to opening the door. And the tandems, in my opinion, should be in an exitable configuration. In other words, at least the uppers are done at least the uppers, um, not one, both. And okay, it's not comfortable or whatever. Well, in that case, we're just leaving the door closed. Um, and people leave, well, I'm an experienced Santa master. I might have to go click, click, you know, in an emergency exit in the event that the guy by the door has the premature deployment and it still hits the tail, even though he took his seatbelt off and we still have to exit. I mean, you're flying in an airplane with an open door. Come on, you know, <laughs> anything can happen. Um, the other one that, that gets me is they open the door a little they just crack it you know oh yeah let's crack it. a little a little air flow yeah if your pilot chute sneaks out through that hole think about it with the door mostly closed you're not just going out of the plane and having a surprise skydive you're getting shredded you know through the, the eye of the needle um, so if the door is going to be opened make sure everybody's ready door you're good get eye contact speak slowly take your time it's only you know, it's only a few extra seconds. We're good. We're good. We're good. Okay, door. And they have an opportunity to veto because they can say, not yet. Wait, wait, wait. Right? Door. And now you open the door all the way. And if it's an otter, please don't get your finger stuck in there. And before you move a door, always look to see if somebody's got a hand in the floater bar that, that could get shredded by the door. Please, hands off the door, everybody. And if you're going to be helping, you either do it from the bottom of the door in the middle, lift it up symmetrically, not from one rail than the other, but from the other side of the door where you're getting it open. But keep your fingers away from the floater bar area. I've, I've uh, seen a lot of people get shredded 
And it's even happened to me a little bit once in a while. Everybody screws that one up sometimes. Um, all right. So I'm getting a little tired. Let's see if anything else is here. And don't do a poised exit. <laughs> oh, that's funny. All right. Andrew has a good point. Um, so Andrew is adding that, that if you're doing an emergency exit, um, you know, like if you're doing a Cessna exit, you don't like climb out on the strut and step on, hang one foot and up, oh, down, arch, you know. But at the same time, it doesn't take that much more time to, to sort of get in the door, stop for just a moment, collect yourself and then exit. Maybe one second. But if you don't do it, especially low experienced people, you just go oh, and you go out the door. Now you got a tumbling deployment where, I mean, I've seen it. Maybe you guys haven't yet, but I've been looking down from airplanes when people did a crappy hop and pop and their pilot chute is like trapped under their arm and nothing's happening and the bag comes and it gets all funky or they're, they're opening while they're tumbling and now their feet are stuck in the risers and they're upside down spinning. These things are possible. So how do you avoid that? You get into the door and you stop and you think about the relative wind and just take that one second to picture where you're gonna go. And yes, the screaming meanies will, will be yelling like crazy, especially if it's an engine out, <laughs> they're gonna be freaking out. But you're one second in the door that is gonna be protecting you from an unstable exit. One second, not 10. You get into the position where you're gonna make a nice presentation of your, your ventral side to the relative wind. Don't mess around with fancy exits. I don't recommend facing the tail if you're doing this one. I say just face straight forward um, and you can make a beautiful exit. And if you suck at hop and pops, unsuck it. Get good, right? Physically practice in a mock-up. Physically practice, you know, in, in terms of the, um, the visualization slash physical exercise, right? The, that really good sim, you know, where it's in your mind and in your body. Uh, it's not just a mock-up. It's, it's, you know, you really role-playing like you did when you were a kid. You know, we've kind of lost that ability to 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 pretend that uh, they were doing some little kids were like, and, they, and suddenly they're in this little world with their Legos and it's real for them because they actually have an imagination. We do too, which is we haven't used it in a while. So I think that's a big part of what makes us uh, great skydivers is the ability to see it clearly, to add, to see it in real time, to literally take the amount of time that it takes to do the thing where you dedicate it because you know that's going to close the gap between where you are and that stunt that you want to pull off or that you have to pull off All right okay so guys i am um <clears throat> i don't want to um i don't want to go so long that i get haggard <laughs> but but this is uh this is great i love that we can do this um and uh and for those that that want to, to stick around in the Zoom after I stop the live stream, we can chat a little bit and this way you won't have to be, um, you know, <laughs> so public. <laughs> so I'm going to stop the live stream. Thank you all so much for, for joining us. Happy safety day. And uh, no, this is not the end of the world. It's not the end of the skydiving reality. We will continue to jump. I'm sure that, uh, that uh, this is not just going to be something we suffer through and it makes the world suckier i think that all of this is going to make the world better i really believe that it's just going to change we're going to be adaptable right that's what we do we can fix it <laughs> in the meantime wash your hands <laughs> wash your hair <laughs> all right i'm going to stop the live stream thank you all so much and don't forget the reason why i do this you remember right because i love you guys i really do not be well.